Kia ora koutou. And uh, no mai hari mai ki te uh, Data and Information Committee for today. And um, so we'll open that up and welcome to Anne and to Gwyneth. Good to see you. We've got a pretty full agenda just to just go through. So apologies. I've got no op, um, apologies have been received prior to publication, but you have one. I will apologise for leaving at half past two to go down to port. Co-chair of the meeting will be leaving to go to port. <laughs> <laughs> Any other apologies anyone knows Carmen. of? No, I've got everybody here. Great. Carmen. Oh, Carmen. She's off to a funeral. Carmen's gone to a funeral. Okay. I move that those apologies be accepted. Thank you. Seconder? Andrew, thank you. Okay, public forum. We had no requests for public forum. Uh, confirmation of the agenda. Okay, staff have requested that report um, 7.2, the contact recreation, be re moved to the end of the reports, and that's allowing um, possibly even the same funeral time for someone to get back. Uh, so I'm going to reorder the agenda and have 7.2. We'll I'll tackle that last day after everything else is done. That's that one. Um, we don't need a resolution. Thank you, Liz. Uh, conflict of interest. Members are reminded the need to stand aside from any decision making if a conflict arises between their role as representative or private external interests. No conflicts have been advised so far. So, item five, confirmation of the minutes. Minutes of the 10th of anybody? Okay, Kate, Councillor Kate, and Councillor Marion will. And everybody in agreement? Aye. 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 Thank you. Outstanding actions of the Data and Information Committee resolutions. Um, there's none actually outstanding because we have got to that. Uh, this one up there, though. Because we usually only note. Okay. Yeah. The only out outstanding, uh, uh, so there's nothing outstanding, yeah. is there? That one has been completed and information, the seismic information has gone up on the website the report. So that's all complete. Lovely, it's up to date. So matters for consideration. First up is Otago Greenhouse Gas Profile. It's a fascinating report. Thank you very much, people. Uh, it's also worrying. And as a region, we account for about 7% of New Zealand gross emissions, uh, net 5.6. <coughs> and we're only about 5% of population and 4.5% of GDP, so we're definitely punching above our weight when it comes to pumping out emissions. Um, <laughs> the report points out that both Queenstown and Dunedin have their own inventories, and there's some differences between the two. Uh, there's some surprises, and there's some, yeah, some real surprises. Actually, Earnslaw's contribution is 1% of Queenstown's transport emissions. And uh, <coughs> we have Tim uh, Torrelli, I don't know if I've said that correctly, and Jerry Ward, Senior Consultants of Climate Change and Sustainability Services with EY to present this paper in a PowerPoint. They'll be joining us online in a minute, but I'll just go to you, Gwyneth, and your team and see if you have anything to <coughs> add. Thanks, thanks Anne. Ma thanks, um, uh, Madam Chair. Um, this is the, the result of not only the good work of EY, but uh, a whole team of people in the City and District Councils, um, and uh, with Anne Yang, who's here as the as the team leader, um, we've received a lot of support in doing this this work, uh, and we're hopeful that we'd we'd really like to take that sort of partnership approach forward. Um, it has been updated quite a few times. You would have seen some of that. Basically, uh, any comments that that our partners made on it, we have acted on, and so it does represent. Uh, what the what the the participants uh, what, uh, have would are satisfied with, I guess, as a representation of, of their emissions estimates. You should probably also note that there is a late data set uh, from PowerNet on electricity emissions, which we will be adding in. It, we it, it just came a bit late to, to get it into the to the report at the moment, but we will be adding it in. We didn't think it was going to be uh, material, so we're quite confident it won't make a huge difference. But in order to be uh, uh, as accurate as we can, we will be incorporating it before moving forward. 
in terms of the picture that it paints, I don't really think, particularly given the report that just came out today, I don't think there's any surprises in it. Um, but it does give us a good base level of information that we can actually, we are in a better position to be able to respond to that report moving forward with the benefit of this information. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, to Tim to go through the the report and uh, and then he can answer any sort of technical questions you might have about the method and the data itself. Welcome, Tim and um, Jerry, and uh, we look forward to. We'll hand over to you. I'll just, I'll just tell people so they know the recommendations that we received this report, and we note the Otago greenhouse gas inventory has been prepared in collaboration with Otago's territorial authorities. So we think about that, but if you can go through your presentation and then we'll come to questions. Over to you. Sure thing. Hi everyone, Thank I'm Jerry Ward. I'm the um, Director of Climate Change and Sustainability um, based in Wellington. Sounds like I've got a bit of um, echoing going on there. Uh, I'm just here really to introduce the amazing Tim Drelly, who has uh, worked with Anne and Anne to prepare this report. Um, I just really want to um, recognise the Council for having the presence to um, be such a leader in this space. And as you say, there's uh, no real surprises, but it's fair to say um, that is true of all climate change risk assessments. Um, and uh, good on you for uh, taking the lead in this space. I hope you find the process um, outcomes uh, compelling going forward. Um, Tim's got a presentation on the key findings and insights and perhaps uh, if we have time, we can talk a little bit to next steps and recommendations going forward. Thanks, Jerry. And thanks to the Otago Regional Council for giving us a forum to present on our recent work. I'm just gonna pull up a few slides. Are those coming through? Yes. Great. Um, so my name's Tim Terrell. I'm a senior consultant in EY's climate change and sustainability practice. And I was heavily involved in the analysis for this project. We were engaged by ORC to develop an Otago region greenhouse gas profile for the year ended 30 June, 2019 to enable ORC to better understand the significant sources of greenhouse gas emissions across its five districts. Um, the aspiration of the project was to help ORC and its districts better understand and target climate change mitigation efforts. The methodology followed the internationally recognized greenhouse gas protocol for cities. Before discussing the findings, I would like to touch on the approach at a high level to begin with, we were introduced to key data owners across ORC's district councils. We also made contact with key stakeholders such as Stats New Zealand and the Ministry for the Environment. We then assessed the regions and individual districts emissions boundaries and emission sources in alignment with the greenhouse gas protocols inventory reporting level. Next began the most intensive part of the engagement, which was gathering data for the identified sources. This involved significant desktop research, reaching out to key stakeholders and working with the district councils. After gathering all the data we could, there were still some gaps. For these gaps, we developed estimation methods. These estimation methods were validated with stakeholders and are outlined within the technical method of our report for transparency. An example of the type of the estimation we had to do was the disaggregation of regional data to the district level. Finally, we identified the most appropriate emission factors and calculated the emissions inventory. Our results were then validated with ORC, the individual district councils, uh, and a contact at Stats New Zealand. The headline results of our work are shown on this slide. When excluding international bunker fuels, to enable meaningful comparison with the national inventory. Gross emissions for the Otago region are 5.7 megatons of CO2e, which represents 6.9% of New Zealand's gross emissions. And net emissions, that, what was that, sir? Uh, we're still seeing your approach slide. We can see the oh. smaller slide. I think you're talking to is in a smaller position. And oh. we don't know how to fix it. Oh, sorry about that, I'll just try and... 
Has, has that gone to the next slide? No, no, I don't think it's the next slide control. It's How maybe if you is that one. How's that? Yes, maybe start and start again. No, um, no, because we're still only seeing the approach slide. So oh, okay. maybe stop there and then share again. Yep. Still sharing. Okay. How's that? Oh, there we go. Yes. That's much better. Thank you. Maybe I'll just leave it on the on this view. Yes. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, so the headline results of our work are shown on this slide. Um, when excluding international bunker fuels, gross emissions for the Otago region are 5.7 megatons of CO2 equivalent, which represents 6.9% of New Zealand's gross emissions. And net emissions for the region are 3.1 megatons of CO2 equivalent, which represents 5.6% of New Zealand's net emissions. Um, if you include international bunker fuels, um, which are consumed in international aviation and shipping activities, um, both these numbers increased by around 100 kilotons. I'll now run through some of the key findings from our work through which I'll discuss the district level results. The primary source of emissions in the Otago region is the agriculture sector, shown as the green component of the bar chart, which is consistent across four of the five districts, so, uh, central Otago, Lutha, Dunedin City and Waitaki. A large proportion of these emissions is related to cattle and sheep farming. Considering this finding, there may be opportunities to target emission reduction activities within livestock farming. However, the carbon intensity of this activity should be considered due to the relative size of this sector, both from an emissions and economic perspective. A challenge for this source is that mitigation technology is still evolving for some high emissions activities, such as dairy and beef farming. <coughs> ORC's role could include supporting local farmers through this transition. Transport, shown in orange on the chart, was more significant in the emissions profiles of Dunedin City and Queenstown Lakes. You'll see that the transport sector is the most significant source of emissions in Queenstown Lakes. The most significant contribution within this sector is related to on-road petrol and diesel consumption. Considering how people move and the modes of transport they choose will be important in tackling emissions from this sector. A shift to electric vehicles will significantly reduce emissions in this sector. Education on the topic of emissions arising from transport decisions could also positively influence emissions and is an area ORC could play into. Electricity makes up a significant proportion of stationary energy. So stationary energy is the blue portion of the chart. However, where fossil fuel boilers are used, this also creates a significant source of emissions. Within this sector, there may be opportunities for fuel switching, for example, to biomass um, pellets um, and electrification to reduce emissions from stationary energy sources, as well as energy efficiency and behavior change encouraged through education. Continued decarbonisation of the New Zealand electricity grid will also yield benefits in this area. Land use and forestry, the yellow component of the chart, is a significant sink of emissions, resulting in net negative emissions from this sector. Clutha District contributes by far the largest um, amount of this sequestration, approximately 60%. However, all of the districts have net positive emissions profiles as the sources of emissions outweigh the sinks. Although the land use and forestry sector is a net emission sink, forest harvest activities are a source of emissions within this sector. Forest conservation and reforestation could be a significant contributor to balancing sources and sinks in the region and reducing overall net emissions, uh, as well as set Otago on the path to net zero emissions. The final finding I would like to touch on, which I believe is quite pertinent to this group, is around information. The many information sources required to collate this emissions inventory um, may present an ongoing challenge for ORC as it seeks to continue to monitor its emissions and assess the effectiveness of mitigation options. Um, we relied on a number of third parties to obtain the activity data used in this emissions inventory. To maintain and update 
the regional emissions inventory, it may be beneficial for LRC to formalize its data management to ensure effective processes are in place to obtain timely data gathering and support an evidence-based climate change mitigation strategy. The final slide. Um, so the, the work performed to date forms an emissions baseline for the Otago region. Looking ahead, it's important to consider the expected changes that will occur in the region and the impact this will have on emissions. This is referred to as the business as usual scenario, which assumes that there will be no significant changes in technology, economics or policies, but that current available mitigation options continue to be deployed. The business as usual scenario models what would happen if we did nothing beyond the status quo. It, it effectively provides a baseline over time based on our current understanding. Following the development of the business as usual, mitigation options can be assessed, uh, can be assessed sorry, against this baseline and modeled under different scenarios. Scenario analysis enables analysis of alternative possible future outcomes. Having a view of these different outcomes will assist with ORC's forward planning. It allows ORC to consider its role in helping to achieve the desired future state and understand what the possible outcomes mean for the Otago economy. These steps will help further ORC's understanding and improve ORC's targeting of climate change mitigation efforts. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take some questions and I've got Hilary, then Michael Deke, I've got some questions as well, and Brian Scott and Mary Hobbs. We'll get those down. Hilary, you start. Thank you. I've got four questions and I'll ask them one at a time because otherwise I'll probably confuse you. Um, the first one is, in the last week or so, we've seen things saying that lakes emit methane. I'm saying that it might not be quite how it comes, but does that factor into anything or is that thing that's going to be coming? I'll attempt to take that question. So we haven't, I personally haven't seen that research come out. Um, and that has not been factored into this emissions inventory. However, these um, the standards that we develop these inventories against are constantly evolving. And so if this becomes some credible science, we could see this starting to be factored into emissions inventories. What it said is something like that it emits just about as much as the landfills in an area, and it actually had a figure on it. It was in the... Just some advice from Julie. Uh, um, wetlands do emit methane, so I don't know. If, yeah. Is yeah. it in the ODT? There's yeah. A story about the, um, the where hydro lakes had flooded areas that had been previously had um, yeah. matter growing on yeah. it, uh, and as that material rots down, methane yeah. rises through the lakes. I think there's a story that I yeah. saw. So I guess it might come into the next. It's some. Um, look Looking at it all. I don't know a lot about this, um, so I'm not going to um, go into it in depth, but um, basically if you think of biogenic methane causing, biogenic emissions causing methane, um, there is more biogenic matter in freshwater than there is in the oceans and they're smaller, right? So um, uh, any water body emits uh, an amount of methane because they have effectively rotting biogenic um, matter in them um, and lakes emit more than oceans. Okay, I'm interested to see that perhaps turning up on the next one. The oh, Tim, oh, sorry. Uh, Tim, is that fair to say that GPC measures the cumin-induced um, GHG instead of looking at nature? So we're actually measuring measuring things that we can control. I would say that's broadly the case. Um, there are other standards that do require you to look at biogenic methane. So, I mean, we, we do look at, uh, you know, landfill emissions, which are biogenic methane emissions. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to say. I don't think it's necessarily a source that's covered within GPC currently, but I could see it becoming a source in the future. Yeah. The second thing is that there's been some suggestion that the oceans, and I'm not sure whether we're as Ota is Otago including the water out to the 
three mile limit or something. I don't know what what we're in control of, but they they apparently are in the opposite direction, namely that things can be good for the sinks. Carbon sinks, yes, in the oceans. Is that are they part of Otago or for the that's a good question. Um, so yes, certainly. Sorry, I could have warned you about these, but <laughs> that's okay. That's good. I, I appreciate it. Um, so I, I guess we define our boundary by the geographic boundary. So I guess the first question is, is part of the ocean considered within Otago's geographic boundary? Which I'm not sure the answer to that. Um, oceans do sequester greenhouse gas emissions. Um, however, it's not really factored into most current counting frameworks. Um, thing number three, th th these are all the same sort of topic really. I take it that since we're using sort of international measures, we are just <coughs> thinking that everything under five metres doesn't count for sequestration. Are we intending to get any, give any as it were, credence to things like snow tussocks as sequestration methods. So, um, so this is just a baseline report, and I guess what Tim's alluding to now is the next steps would be to turn it into a planning tool, which would be um, having conversations around what interventions you may or might would be cost effective, um, and you could look at tussocks in that in that yeah. context. Um, just wanted to clarify a point which relates to both your two previous questions. The inventory looks at human-induced, so natural, naturally occurring processes, which you, um, may be sinks or sources of carbon, sort of negate themselves out. Does that make sense? So if the, co co the ocean is naturally absorbing carbon, that's considered part of a natural uh, process. But your point around lakes is if we made a lake, yes. then potentially we're introducing a new source um, of methane, which is something that could be considered in the future. Yep. And you'll be pleased to know last, um, forestry, how do we factor in whether they were there? For uh, you, you touched on, I think, the cutting them down has, a, has an effect, but how do, do we generally factor in the ones that are there intentionally just to sit and be carbon sinks compared with the ones that will be cut down and replanted and cut down and replanted, partly because trees, I gather, have different sequestration when they're fully mature trees than they do on the way through. Uh, how, do, how do we deal with all that stuff? Do you want to deal with that one, Tim? Yeah, sure. So, so that's a really good question. And uh, yes, based on the age of a tree, it has different carbon sequestration rates. Um, in terms of how it's been done in this piece of work, it is applying average sequestration rates provided by the Ministry for the Environment. Um, I think, you know, looking ahead, you can look to improve the granularity of this analysis by looking at stock. Well, I suppose the, um, I believe the MBIE does publish some information around the age of the, of the specifically planted forest um, stock. Um, so there we can start to discern between the different ages and account for emissions slightly differently. So I think it's definitely an area for further work in the future that could be considered, but it hasn't as part of this initial baseline work. Thank you, Hilary. We'll move on. We've got Michael Deacon, then Brian Scott, then Marion, then Michael Mills. Yeah, Tim, um, thank you very much for this detailed report. Turn your microphone uh, on, please. Uh, not working. I can hear you. Can you hear him, Tim? Yeah, yeah, I hope that's better now. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, I was saying, Tim, thank you very much for a very comprehensive report. One of the things that stood out for me was the uh, the widespread harvesting you and the team did uh, across our region from multiple sources. And that, I guess, is the point of your advice to us um, in your key findings table about since this is just a baseline and since we're in this for the long haul, uh, we need to start to think about ways of um, formalising our own data, um, having our own ways of processing after collection and so on. 
it seems to me to be a very complicated business. You as a consultant have done it exceptionally well for this baseline re report. Have you got a model you can put in front of us for another organisation like Otago Regional Council, which has actually managed to pull off what you're recommending to us? Because it does seem to be a very big task. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Um, and yeah, so I, I can't think of a, I guess an example, similar framework that was adopted by a, a city. However, there are frameworks specifically for C. So the C40 data management framework, for example, is one that you could look to apply for your region. I think, you know, a good starting point is to really, hopefully the report does this, but look at all the sources of information and start to formalize the collection so you can still maintain those sources, but making sure you have an understanding of, you know, the data landscape, where the information is coming from, how regularly they update that information, whether you have to do any further work if you're running on a biannually or annual grant basis. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably where I'd start. Establishing that, certainly we can share the C40 data management framework as well, because that's a pretty good uh, what, can baseline. You explain what C, can you explain what C40 is? Sure, so C40, I'm just gonna do a bit of Googling. So the C40, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a partnership of, looks like it's 97 cities now. Um, and they're working together to, I guess, to help to show what climate leadership looks like in cities. Um, and so as part of that, they have they make commitments, they help provide material, reference material, such as this data management framework to help cities along their climate change, you know, adaptation and mitigation journey. That sounds exactly pertinent to us. Are we yeah, familiar I just with wanted C40? to let you, Dundee is one of those 90 participants. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brian. Uh, Brian Scott, we've got a lot of people to get through here. Brian? Oh, I'll try to talk quickly then. I want to sort of pick up on Gwyneth's comment to uh, use this as a planning tool um, in relation to forestry. Um, like on page 30 of slash two th of the 230, it actually gives a breakdown on forestry. So it talks about the pre-1990 plant of forest, the post-1989 forest, that's in relation to our ETS requirements, then regenerating natural forests. Like in the Kluta district, for example, it had a benefit of 3.1 megatons, which is you know the key emissions balancing thing for the whole plan. <laughs> and as they said though, half of that was lost when you did the harvest. So you can sort of see the benefit, I suspect, of some of these people shutting the gate and avoiding the harvest process. Now, like at Council, one of the things we're trying to grapple with here and now is, is it a good thing to plant forestry in water short catchments? And I, I think obviously it's, it's not. When you look at Waitaki, they have about a quarter of the amount of forestry as yeah. a matter of interest. So my question is, um, it's really important from an emissions perspective having forestry. Well, that's the current situation. It might change, or, or maybe we'll move into native, more native. Maybe that's the answer. But um, when it comes to talking about the negatives of forestry and water short catchment, I mean, should this council, for example, as a planning tool, be identifying areas where it's actually good to plant forestry, noting the benefit, the emissions benefit? Um, yes, that's something we could look to do in the land and water plan, the upcoming land and water plan, yeah. if you thought that was an appropriate course of action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Marion. Just before I go, um, my apologies. Under the stationary energy issues, there is no reference to what happens on berthed ships that are burning fuel in port in order to keep their freezers in the containers operational. Now, in Californian ports, they use it by electricity. Here in New Zealand, we use it by burning uh, fuel. It's not excluded, is it, by anyone's rules? She asks. I, I don't believe it, it is. I think we may have excluded it on 
the basis of lacking the information to to quantify it. Um, but I, I don't believe that would be an excluded source by you know, the, the greenhouse gas protocol Quite standard, less. for example. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael Laws. Uh, a couple of questions. What's the minimum coverage of planted forests for measurement in this? Uh, I'm informed that, for example, farmer shelter belts and um, trees that they grow are not included because they don't fit a national size criteria. Is that correct? I will probably have to take that one on notice and get back to you. We use the um, the, the land use model, the Lucas model, uh, developed by the Ministry for the Environment, which is based on geospatial data mapping. Um, I will have to, I'll come back to you on that one. I'll, I'll find okay, out if cool. they have a minimum. Well, I'm like well, that, then leads to the, that leads to the next question. Um, in terms of sequestration, um, I assume that you're counting trees that are apples, cherries, even grapes um, in terms of or not? That's a good question. I think if it's a tree, well, I might take that one notice as well. I think if it's a tree, it would be. If it's shrubbery and vegetation, um, that may be excluded because it doesn't fit within the, the land use classes that we've focused on. I think it's five metres, isn't it? But, and yet it would be doing its job in terms of soaking up carbon dioxide. Certainly. You see, because that, I think, could fundamentally change Central Otago's figures quite a bit because there's quite a lot of horticulture there. And finally, the net emissions, um, I note that, um, that's the other thing, landfills, that I'm, a, I'm aware of them creating quite significant issues again in my neck of the woods. Um, are they included in these stats? Uh, uh, sorry, emissions from landfills? Yep, they're included. Yeah. All right, including those that are closed. <laughs> Correct. It's, it's all on the tables. Sorry, we, I'm just asking. You. No, that's a good question. So on the closed landfills, we we had some we had some data gathering issues. So we we included yep. those for which we could get sufficient information. Um, okay. However, there was a handful handful that we couldn't, and we also focused on landfills that were closed after the year 2000 because um, the ones before that we, we thought were would be relatively immaterial because by now most of their carbon would have decomposed. So can you come back to me on the horticulture one in particular, please? Yes, I can. Uh, Thank I you can very much. answer the one about fruit trees aren't included in the New Zealand emissions trading scheme. Um, and whoever said it was five metres is right <laughs> um, about the height, uh, which is based okay. on the sequestration rates. A point of clarity around that. Uh, so, so now, now, as I... Yeah, that, that. Now, as I understand, just as a point of clarity, the uh, the rules around uh, the tree that you can plant that it, that it must have the ability to be a species that will grow to five metres, so it necessarily won't get to five metres. Uh, Manuka yeah. would be a prime example. So, if we're actually looking, if we're actually looking to find out as a province what we are actually um, sequestering. And we may be a province in many areas that don't get trees or yeah, yeah woody trees up, up to five metres. Mm -hmm. Yet we could be doing an exceptionally good job and having uh, you know, having a net uh, yeah, a net position, yet not being rewarded for that simply because of species. So so when do we actually analyse that? And that may not have been in your brief, but I think that's actually a uh, could well be a pitfall. Can I? Perhaps there's uh, to me there's two elements of it is whether there is a recognised methodology for doing that, um, and the second one is something we need to think about in terms of perhaps the planning going forward, which is um, once you sign up to a methodology, um, it has implications for where that's recognised. And um, Joe just alluded to recognition under the the nationwide um, ETS is possibly something you'd want to consider in terms of what um, what mi mitigation interventions you might do. Because if it's not recognised, then it doesn't get included in the yeah. national... Uh, ostensibly, it doesn't have the value. 
as a collector. Uh, yeah, but that, that, but that you, yeah, but, you don't have to accept that. Yeah, yeah, but that yeah, it actually, as if we're looking for our environment, mm. if we're looking for our environment, and our environment doesn't cover species that will be measured, and that that can be that that, that 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 some politician didn't put into the protocols. Correct. Uh, why should we be penalised? So somewhere we need to be able to take that argument back if, in fact, we are doing a good job. Agreed. for the support, though, but thank you. Good point. That's a very good Let's point. Let's move ourselves on, because we've had this discussion before around snow tussocks and stuff, and I'm sure it'll continue. I've got Andrew Noon, then Gary, then Kate. Thanks, Madam Chair. My question was around uh, the um, proactive planning tool, using this data for decision-making in the future. And I just wondered not so much from a policy point of view, but from a regulatory point of view, and we talk about landfills um, and other um, waste generating uh, facilities, would potentially in the future the operator of a landfill would be required to supply the data um, in terms of their emissions as a consent condition? So it's not ORC having to follow this up, it's actually a requirement of the um, operator of the facility under a consent condition. Um, yes, I guess that's something we could look into. I would just, um, yeah, again, I would make want to make sure that we're not making them provide data to us and someone else through a national scheme. That's all. Is that it? Yeah, no, thank you. No, thank cool. you, Gary and then yep. Kate. Um, yeah, my question, I think, to the experts first. I'll have some comments later on, maybe, in debate. But just, I wouldn't mind drilling in just on um, certainly the waste element when we look at active landfills and then the um, farm fills and rural waste. So for our region we have two areas, Dunedin and Queenstown, who have active large landfills collecting large volumes for the population. And then when I look at the numbers that are in comparison, say in the um, Dunedin area, so you've got 3.92% for the active landfill, which would be um, obviously Green Island, and then 3% is farm fills and rural waste. And I suppose my question is around, well, how much confidence can we have around that calculation for the farm fills and rural waste? Because I'm assuming that there is a large amount of assumption and interpretation going into that number. Um, and when I think of farm fills that I see at the moment, and given that most farms, or many farms, are on waste collection with wheelie bins, I'd be very surprised at those numbers. So is there any detail around how that is made up? Mm. That's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and there are certain areas which are, I'll say, more highly estimated. Um, this is one of them which was provided by Stats New Zealand, and it's very much a, a top-down approach where they, they use land use data and I guess national, they have an estimate around national farm fills and rural waste, and they apportion that down to the regional level by utilizing land use data. Um, so it is highly estimated and it doesn't necessarily take into account, as you say, probably the more anecdotal experiences you have where there is just less farm fills and rural waste in Otago, potentially compared with other areas. Um, it certainly is an area where further work could be warranted to, to get more Otago specific or bottom up data rather than this top down information. Um, but as we've mentioned earlier, it's, it's more of a initial baseline um, and there are, certainly are areas for improvement. I'd, I'd agree that this is random. Okay, thank you. And But when I look at the Waitaki example versus the others, Waitaki is noticeably different. And if it is just an, an interpretive um, issue, then why was Waitaki so different to the others? Um, is this, and sorry, just to clarify, is this the relative farm fills and rural waste emissions for Waitaki? Yes, yeah, just that one. Yeah, um, so it was a portion at the district level using agricultural GDP. So if Waitaki is less or more, it's because their GDP from agriculture is less or more, depending on the direction. I'm sorry, I don't have the data right. in front of me. So okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Next is Kate and then Gretchen. You may wish to say that I can't ask this question, but and Tim, I, 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 it's about the um, where Michael was going before about trees on farms, and I just want to ask in a different way. I don't want to worry about the, the um, emissions trading because that's fraud, but in the released today Climate Commission report, 
they say at paragraph 64, the additional cut, uh, this is on the, the Climate Commission report, the additional carbon removed by small areas of vegetation on farms and in urban green spaces is not currently recognised in target accounting, which I think is what we're doing, but though it is in New Zealand greenhouse gas inventory. So in the inventory you've done for today, is it included or excluded? Um, yep, so for this one, I'm going to go back to the Ministry for the Environment and confirm the granularity at which they're, they're modelling land use for the Lucas land use map because we used that data. Okay. Um, so I, I can't tell you at this point, but I'll take it on notice and get back to you hopefully later today. I'm sorry if that's repeating it. I just wanted it. No, yeah, it's it's different. Lots of pieces coming back to us on, which yeah. is great. Um, direction. Thank you. Um, yeah, the usual question of we've got the recommendation, so moving to that sort of discussion. Um, oh, and whether or not we're going, yeah, it's a question on the recommendation. So um, whether we've got there that we note the inventory and baseline data that will be publicly available. So as of this moment, it is publicly available. So, yep, we're noting that. It's actually really important to people of Otago to understand, even at this level of information. So we are collaborative partners with our TAs and city wow. councils. How does it work that we manage to release this in a form that people in the community can interact with and understand? Um, I feel that it's important to do that as soon as possible. So is it that we would want to do that collaboratively? <coughs> so that's why we're not quite sure at the moment. Or should we be being a bit more um, proactive than what that says? Thanks. Well, uh, you're correct, actually, Gretchen. Uh, we have really only got this report quite recently. Uh, so in terms of how we approach it as a collaboration with the district and city councils in terms of taking it out to the community, we, we haven't yet had a chance to have that conversation and, um, and that needs to be had because it is their, it's their data. Uh, so I'm, uh, we have a comms plan from our perspective and, uh, and the TAs have agreed that we can release it okay. at this point. But in terms of being you know, the proactive piece in comms and engaging communities, uh, mm. we need to talk to them before we come up with a plan. It's certainly in our minds to do that, yeah. but, yeah, we, we need to work with them. I'm back if we don't say it, but I'm sure we will. That's great. Yep. Thank you. Uh, most of my questions have been answered by other people's questions, but I'll just... Uh, there's a couple of things. My first one is around methodologies. Um, am I right in thinking that it's pretty important, or it seems to me that it'd be important to get the TEAs and OIC using the same accounting methodologies? Because there's some differences in there which I think are going to be important. Are we thinking about that? Well, I'll answer that, and Tim, you can correct me. So we are using the same framework, which is the GPC, and um, within the GPC, there's flexibilities in, in each category, depending on the availability of data. So um, from my understanding, our data is quite inclusive. We um, asked everyone who we know of that have data and um, use a method that's somewhat consistent with SAS New Zealand. So um, the discrepancies is due to the estimation methods and data, not the bigger methodology framework. Okay. So that should be a relatively simple thing to, to align where those differences are. Um, if the TLA is agreed to, to use our methods, yes, and I think um, we persuaded Queenstown Lakes somehow, Tim. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see how that one plays out. Do you have anything to add to that, Tim? Um, no, no, I completely agree with everything Anne has said. Um, yeah, I, I think we did analyse some of the differences between our inventory and Queenstown Lakes and Dunedin cities um, and we're able to in most cases where there was a discrepancy understand like, the reason for the discrepancy and it mostly was due to differing data sources or different calculation approaches but all of them were in alignment with the greenhouse gas protocol so as Anne said there is flexibility under that framework but as you highlight ideally everyone's using the same source data same methodology, the ones that are believed to be, you know, the most accurate and the most representative of the region. 
Um, so it definitely is an area worth for yeah, seeking my, consensus on, my, I'll say. My next question on that um, was, is it necessary, and once you get all this sorted out between the TLAs, for us to have these three different things going on, QLDC doing theirs, DCC doing theirs, and we're doing one, or are we able to get to a point where only one lot of, one report is done for all of us? Well, I, uh, I guess in my in my view, it would be really good if we were we just did one thing, uh, and that would be um, most efficient and effective. Um, that's a conversation with the you know and a and development of a partnership, and um, and will take some time. Um, and I think the the benefit of moving along with the, the more proactive, um, looking at scenarios and taking this information forward is that that will be a collaborative exercise as well. And so the more the more we work together, the more we're likely to actually get on the same page in relation to the data. I just want to add all the TAs agreed in the methodology used for this purpose, which is this report. Um, so um, and I think it is important, as Anne said, if we walk if working together together that we're singing off the same song sheet effectively in terms of thinking about uh, options um, for mitigation, that doesn't preclude a TA using their own methodology to for for a different purpose, if that right. makes sense. Thanks, I can see where we're going with that, it's quite clear. Um, so the, the uh, last thing is, I'd like to get a movement a seconder, but before I do, I want to think about these next steps and making sure that recommended next actions are happening. I was um, talking to a few of you about this and wondering if, um, how, how do we, We've got this, this great um, resource now and uh, we're probably not in a position to put in a mitigation plan right just yet, but how do we get to that point? And I'm wondering if the next step, because we have to do it in this in collaboration, is it to go to the uh, the mayoral forum? And I suppose that's almost a question for Andrew, but it seems that we need to get everybody on board and get moving. But I don't want this report to just to disappear and gather dust anywhere. And I want to make sure that the TLAs and um, us are on board with some next steps to can go. I, can and I I've move a motion Kate, then? Hang on. I've got Kate, um, somebody else, yep, and I'll be in one, uh, Kevin, yep, yep. and I'm just Michael, question. but can we yep. move the motion first? What I, well, I, I was going to ask for a change for the motion first, if I can, along the lines you're talking about. I'm happy to move subject to, I just want to understand number four. Um, I'm just wondering whether, and it's a question for staff, um, notes the, per the further use of the inventory to inform development of mitigation options and scenarios for Otago. If we asked for, uh, one is to get that a time frame, because I think one of the, for me, transport is one of the low-hanging fruit, and that may require a change to our annual plan, plan next year, um, potentially. But the other one is understanding the ramifications of the climate change report and what might come from that. If we put a time frame, what would be a realistic time frame to understand that we could get a report back trying to bring those together? That's the question. Because, uh, well, yeah. I think within the terms of reference of this, I am actually not fully understanding your question. Sorry. Or Gwyneth might be able to clear I, it. So um, in terms of, I can give you, we can come up with a time frame in terms of having a look at the report that came out today mm -hmm. and what the implications might be for ORC. We can, we can um, I'll just come up. These guys can come up with a time frame to do that. In terms of this report going forward, we need to have, as Anne's already alluded to, we need to have a discussion as a collective group mm -hmm. of regional councils and TAs about yeah. how we do this, which I think is where Alex is going in terms of the mayoral forum, um, before I'd like to put any time frames on that because we would be committing others, yeah. other organisations, to time frames today, which I don't think we can do. I only recommend on in our terms of reference. Or to another party. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Is that right? I was just going to say, I'm, I would like to move a motion to refer this report to the Policy Committee. Policy Committee? Yeah. And and that way... You, well, policy and strategy, sorry, is it? Uh, policy and strategy. strategy. Yeah, or planning and whatever. Is it planning and strategy? Strategy and planning. Oh, gosh. <laughs> we weren't simple, were we? Um, no. 
Um, sorry. Um, sure, that was my fault. Uh, it was actually. Yeah, right, so I'm, I'm putting up my hand. That we you can shoot me on this one. <laughs> but refer this to the policy committee. I so refer this to the policy committee for further um, development or further consideration, and that that allows then the policy committee. Because I also want who, as part of that motion, um, suggest that the um, that we petition central government to reconsider uh, this um, rule that only trees over five metres be considered a mitigation strategies, because I've just read um, a series of worthy articles uh, from particularly the European Journal of Horticulture that suggests that um, fruit, orchards and vineyards... Classic lands. Yes, are a major carbon sequester and should be included, and they have been saying so for some time. So I do think that this... Is, and it will affect central Otago in particular in a huge way if you were to include orchards in these kind of statistics. Okay, um, that's so, got that point. That's so so could I that. suggest, therefore, that we refer this report to the policy committee? What about referring just that piece so we don't hold this up? This sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Just that yeah. piece around um, yeah. looking at that five-metre tree rule, which I think is part of the Kyoto Protocol which is quite a major for the government to deal with, but it's certainly something worth trying. Other countries. And, oh, they haven't. And, Lisa, don't need to. Kevin, you had something to say. Yes. Um, look, actually, I really think that's exceptionally important because as a, as a member of this, uh, of this council, I really want to know uh, what my province is actually doing. And if we are, in fact, heading down the right lines, although we may have the wrong species, well, we should actually know that because I, I think that is really important. It, it's... I, um, I was in EY House in Auckland last uh, last week and then went to a responsible investment seminar all about um, bringing the future to the present, especially on, on carbon sequestration and the challenges that we have. So one of the things um, that, that I noted up there is actually trying to work out where we are actually positioned. Uh, so while, while we have... Uh, this really, really good report, and I'm not knocking the report, but I just whether I've missed it is where... Where is a, a, a province similar or a zone, an area similar to Otago, where do we fit in, in the world? Where, where does a similar uh, similar geographical spot, uh, geographical area, um, yeah, how, how does our emission rates compared uh, around the world? Uh, when, when we know that our, you know, certainly if, if, I, if I look straight at livestock, where we're, we're emitting... 50% less emissions than any other system within the world. So we have to we have to do our bit and con continue to reduce our emissions. But it would be really neat to see where we fit because 9.58 is the world record for 100 100 metres held by Hussein Bolt, and I don't think I'm ever going to get there. But I'm certainly would like to head towards it. But we have to know where we sit and how much work we have to do. So, so where Tim, the, have, have I missed that in the report, Tim, or what? Yeah. Closed off questions, but we'll just throw that at you, Tim, in case you've got an answer to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll respond with the classic consultant answer, which is that I guess that wasn't in, in our scope. Um, cool. And unfortunately, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of a comparable region to, or, a, you know, a benchmark to compare Otago against. Um, something I can have a brief look into there. So, so if I could just go, just subsequent to that, to, to Gwyneth and the strategy team, when they're, they're just busy with something at the moment. Uh, right, right. So, 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 um, so when we go out to our public uh, with this report, and, and look, I, it, it needs to be out there, it needs to be shown, so that, that's cool, but where, where are we going to give them the comparison of this is where we sit, um, this type of what we're doing here, we're actually need to sharpen this up, we, we need to get this better, or, or how do we compare with the rest of the world? Because at the end of the day, if, if you can only fix things a certain degree, and we're asking for for too much of a fix, so, you know, it'd be, I, I think the public we needs... We can go and have a look at some potential benchmarking. Um, I will throw back a little bit at you at in terms of do you want to, it's a policy question around whether you want to compare yourself against another region or you want to be talk, talking about the national target of net zero emissions by 20. 
So what what so we can do benchmark, but what 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 do you want? What is the purpose of that benchmarking in terms of driving behaviour change? We're just yeah. receiving a report here, yeah. and we're beyond the question stage. But you're asking if the benchmarks. I mean, they range to the G20s. They, they they range. There's all sorts of benchmarking, and quite a few of them. So, sorry, Madam Chair. The, the the issue here is we were just we were just talking about them releasing it to the public. So I'm just. What do you release to the public? Yeah. So, so I'm just saying the explanation to go with that. Um, and, th and that's the critical part. You know, look, oh, the, the fellow from Amazon's just launched a rocket. Uh, you know, it's launching a rocket up, to, and the emissions from that will be incredible. But um, you know, we're not doing that. And, and as far as I can see, in our province, we're making every effort to to do the very best and do things. So we need to know. We, we actually do need to know how we compare within the scheme of things. And, and we're going, don't we? I, I mean. Um, Otherwise, you're just you're, you're beating yourself up for something you may not necessarily need to be beat, beaten up by. We we do know how Otago compares with other regions in New Zealand, um, on the yep. same scale, and we know that um, Otago's population is around about five percent of New Zealand population, and we're about six point five percent um, of of the emissions. Yeah, that's absolutely and, correct. And also the emissions are going up compared to some regions that, that the total emissions are going down. I could provide you a table after this, compare. But we had that information from the DCC in November that um, that our transport emissions are going up dramatically, yet our agricultural emissions are going down. So that's, I mean, that's been used in here anyway. So, so what... The, the, the actual basis on population is a bit of a misnomer because it's around the activities that we're actually doing and what those activities are contributing to the world scenario. Because some yeah, areas... I think we need to move on from this, Kevin. These are questions that I don't think are in the scope of this inventory report and baseline data. If you'd like to have that conversation, let's bring it up somewhere else because we're not going to ever get through this otherwise. So I, so you're happy, just a just point of clarity, that you're happy to for me to respond... If I'm not happy with what gets sent out in the paper, you're happy me, for me to respond with my concerns. It's already out in the paper, Kevin. It's, it's, this is a public meeting in a public paper. Good as gold. If we've got no other explanation going with it, I'll just ask those questions publicly. No problem. Thank you. Just add. <laughs> okay. um, is there anything else to add? Have I missed anything on that? Do we have the, anyone prepared to... I'll move all of them. You'll move all of them. And um, note that we were sent to leave the Otago now. Uh, have we got something in here, I'm not sure that we have yet, of getting this off to the uh, mayoral forum? I wonder, Michael, with your piece, for further support the strategy and planning committee to review the five meter And other well. associated issues. Uh, listen, I mean, the point is... To explore this. Exactly. Of There's lots of other things that come out of this report. That's the place to go and do it. Associated issues. OK, yeah. that's great. I think that'll help Kevin. Well, well probably it doesn't support you. I know what you're saying. <laughs> listen, listen, I hear you. Let's have a look. She wants to be more, us to be more specific, and she's quite <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Other associated issues. Okay. When we look yeah, at yeah, this yeah, in yeah, a month's yeah. time, okay. to it means nothing. To review the five yeah. metre rule and, and methods other, of capturing the and other, carbon yeah, sequestration yeah. of tussocks, soil, horticultural activity. Does that do it? Yep, cool. Tussocks, soil, soil and horticultural activity. activity. Is that, is that doing it for you, Michael? Is that saying what it's doing? Um, in, relate, or in, other, in other horticulture. Why not throw on the effects of carbon sequestering organisations? Dams, then, while we're here. <sighs> no, because they're not within control, I don't think. Um, I'm happy to second. Start, it will when, start the conversation, yeah. though. Yeah. No, but they are. They're man made dams. What's that? The effect of a man made dam, the hydro dams, oh, putting right. methane out. Um, can I suggest that we discuss that at the Policy and Strategy yeah. Committee? Yes, well, uh, I know, we don't need to do that. Yeah. But what we, we have found is a flaw in the system that penalises us for, for sequestering carbon. And it penalises Otago quite significantly. It may, as I've looked at, there may be both sides of that equation, but anyway. Um, I'm, I'm a bit concerned here. that we may not have 
um, capacity in our organisation to be doing this at the moment. But it can be referred to the committee to look at further. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's right. All right. <laughs> Anyhow, I so move. Do we have a second? I'm happy to second, but I'm just going to check that last one. Is it for the committee to review or to ask the government to review? No, it's for the committee to review. Okay. So, so in other words, discuss this matter a little further before we yeah. work out what to do next. I'm glad we've got the power to. Point, point of clarification, <laughs> yep. Madam Chair. Yeah. Point of clarification. Should I, um, point six replace point four? That's the first. No, because no, because point six is about challenging parts of the protocol. Point four is about using the inventory to inform our mitigation options. But point four is a direction forward using what we have here, but point six is saying we want to go to strategy and planning because we have questions around what's in here. So I think I can explain no, it's this. Not around here, it's around the yeah. protocols, uh, around yeah. the government agreements. Uh, 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 until you clarify that, you can't go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We, we are going to clarify that at the Strategy and Policy Committee. But listen, the point is, nothing can come out of this that won't go through strategy and planning anyhow. Now, that yep. one other thing is here, I, 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 I was thinking, and I don't seem to have, we have our I'd like to put in at number seven, that we refer this to the mayoral forum to establish a uh, collaborative operation with the TLAs, because we can't do it on our own. Oh. I don't have a problem with that. That's right. Great. I just wanted in there. Yeah. There you go. Okay. And you're putting the... Yep. I'll put all seven. Do we want a date to bring this to strategy planning? Oh. Leave that to the chief executive. That is proper executive control. Oh, well done. <laughs> no, it Thank should have so a date much. on it. It should have a date. <laughs> Come on. Next one or the oh, one? Oh, look. Oh, whatever. Can I? Yes, please do. When's, okay. It won't be the next um, one. No, it won't be because, I mean, the, the first issue I have is that climate change wasn't one of your four priorities so, yeah. for the LTP. Thank you. And so the difficulty I have is that, that we proposed some climate change resource but took it out when you gave us the four priorities and we, we rejigged the budget. So I don't actually have any resources to do this work. Oh, I could probably do that for you, though, by providing you some of the worthy academic articles that have been written in the last two years. Well, yes, that's true. Although, still, somebody has to read them, write a paper, and all the rest of it. So that's, that's partly my problem to solve. Should we just say this year? What I'm, yes, yep, you can, can say do. this year, but what I am flagging to you is unbudgeted. Yes, and I think uh, we're flagging that um, the next annual plan, we may have to reconsider this. So before Michael, the next annual plan. Yeah, Michael, 13th so of October, I'm hearing we can oh, come back with a report on the 13th of October. Okay. That meeting. Lovely. Cool. Oh, okay. Do you want me to refer you? Do I have a second? Next. Yeah. Have I second that? Uh, Hillary, thank you. Uh, oh, no, second to Council of Wills, you're already done. Thank you very go. much. Um, put the motion. Aye. And thank you to all the staff. And thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, really good. Yeah. Involved in that. Okay. Um, okay, so next on our agenda. Seriously. Thank you so much for hmm. this. Um, Hopefully, Bell, Chris. You just think all the horticulture. I'm sure other countries are being almost all the same. Just the Italians are receiving the charges. We will look into that. About the Lake Boy programs, which is going to make people up in the uh, mm. in the Great Lakes quite happy. Thank you. Yes, it would is. you like to talk to Agreed. Um, the report? Okay. I can do it. So um, this paper was put together so we could inform you where we are at with the Lake Boy program. We've had um, the Lake Haze installed in 2019 and then we had a long break until 
we're going to get the, the another two um, installed in Lakes Wanaka and Wakatipo. And also, I thought there was a good opportunity to share some of the outcomes that we've had with Lake Hayes as well. So um, there, there are some data presented in this paper um, just to show um, how the, the boy um, worked for the first two years and what was good and negative about this first two years and how um, that is going to help us to improve our program um, going forward. Okay, do we have any questions? Kate, then Brian. Uh, the science behind this is way beyond my capacity to completely understand it, but I'm just wondering, um, we got a submission in the long-term plan by a gentleman whose name escapes me from the Wakatipu area, who, did you manage to see that, uh, he was, he was, he said the boys are great, but we needed more of them, and I'm just testing your understanding of that, while this start is interesting, and... Yeah, so... Um, we don't have any boy at the moment, yeah. so what we do, we have like a similar um, data that we collect once a month with the, our CTD equipment, and mm. the, that gives us some um, results. Um, and then we're going to have one boy to start with, okay. you know, um, and then we, we've picked a site that will hopefully be a good representation of the lake. Of course, the lake is massive, you know, mm. like for Wakatipa and Wanaka as well. But we do have more boys um, proposed of, on the next long-term plan. That it's um, depending on approval, of course, you know, but we did propose some more yeah. boys to go in those lakes. Yeah. I suppose the question I should say is, um, while this is good science, mm -hmm. what would be the best practice? How many would you, as a scientist, suggest maybe well, needed? It, it's yeah. hard to tell when you don't have any there okay. and then you never had looked at any data. Um, I, to be um, to be honest, I think one boy will be very valuable, mm -hmm. two will be great and we're going to be more confident, you know, okay. like for a lake like um, Wakatipo, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I think we're going to have, like, a big addition to our program with those boys because they tell a story that we cannot really see um, the way we are doing right now. So. Great. Thank you. And Brian and then Gary. Right. Yeah, I mean, thank you for doing the boys' work. And I suspect they provide certain information and certain information they don't provide. Um, I was interested in Lake Hayes where it said it basically verified that there was very little mixing that was actually going on, which ultimately resulted in a deterioration of the lake ecosystem overall. So, look, I'm just trying to remember exactly what the next step is for Lake Hayes. I think it's a management plan. You know, it's just because of this is the next step mixing. Is the next step what, sorry? Mixing. Oh, uh, well, yeah, so I think like all the restoration strategies are around that. Like I think the main the main goal for Lake Hayes is to stop the addition of nutrients in the catchment from the yeah. catchment. I think that's what has been shown that will be the best outcome for the yeah. lake. There are other ways of restoration that will be like um, um, kind of flushing the lake a bit um, faster, you know, because of the residence time, it's a bit longer at the moment. So there are ways of like breaking the stratification. So with the, the, the all the options that I don't know if you guys remember from back in the days that we've had, but like the augmentation with the Arrow um, River and all the options yeah. that were shown before, um, they, they focus on these, you know, like restoring in a way that we're going to break that stratification. But the stratification is a natural process. It's not, it's not, it's not, there's not the main reason why, um, that the lake is with the problem that it is, you know. So, yeah, I think the, the main focus should be on reducing nutrient inputs in the lake. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. You got Andrew here. Who's next? Gary. Thank you. Um, I was really delighted to see this report, but it's to me, I, I suppose my question is around, well, we have a total change of policy here, and it certainly maybe it's because I missed three years um, between my previous term and this term. But in my previous term, I formed a permanent dint in my forehead from banging it against the proverbial ORC brick wall when it come to Lake Boys on behalf of the Lake Hayes community, who had spent, I think, a decade trying to get a Lake Boy, and the ORC pushed back on it constantly, all the way through all of their applications to annual plans, 
Uh, they missed out on funding from Central Lakes Trust and others when it comes to Lake Boys. And then when I read this report and I see the very positive messages about how great Lake Boys are, how we acknowledge the useful tool to monitor and better understand lake dynamics, it's a total change of direction. I suppose my question is, well, how can we suddenly change our position like that? And second question beyond that would be then, well, do we owe those people an apology? I don't believe current staff can make apologies on behalf of former staff. staff. I can say, though, that the last council, towards the end of its conclusion, Gary, was just magnificent. <laughs> that previous council was a shocker. So we've now ended up with the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> Come on, let's listen and a, to and, and, a, and a chief executive that's prepared to listen to science. Do you have, do you have a question? For yes, the I team, do. Please, Mike. Um, listen, I'm sorry, please forgive me, but I looked at these lovely diagrams that you've pointed out and I couldn't work out what they said to me. All right. So can you just, I'm sure I can't be the only one, so can you just oh. tell me, please? Yeah. So if you go to what's good and what's bad, that's yeah, what I'm if, sort of looking at. See, if you go, I'll show you, I'll talk about two of those graphs. Um, if you go to page 72, if you have them them available, so it's showing the water temperature, and then pretty much on the top here is the surface of the lake, and then on the bottom of the uh, yeah, of the graph will be yeah. um, the bottom of the lake throughout the time. So when you see those different colors going on, it means that the lake is stratified. There are layers of different temperatures. So when it's red, it's very warm for the lake. The yellow line is the thermocline, which is like an invisible line that stops the mixing between the bottom and the top of the lake. And then it stops the mixing. So you don't have like any exchange of anything of oxygen or anything. And then on this line, if we jump to um, page 73, and we're going to see dissolved oxygen. And then the blue area here, it's, like, it's over the summer period. Yeah. And that means that this whole part of the water column is anoxic. There is no oxygen in that lake. So it leaves only that very thin top surface for the animals that live in it to survive. But then you've got algae growing, algal blooms in the lake, which are consuming the whole oxygen of it. They produce oxygen during the day, but they consume everything at night. So it means that it put all these species in a very critical position in that lake at the moment. So it's, it's yeah. So that shows very clearly what's happening to Lake Hayes, you know, in an ecological, more sense of way. But, um, yeah. So you could draw a, a map of that, which would show what it should look like if it was a healthy lake, and it wouldn't look like that. Yeah, so you you wouldn't have that sustained period of dissolved oxygen, um, a zero dissolved oxygen in the lake. You you would need, you know, like oxygen in the water so the animals can live pretty much, isn't it? So that's the main thing here that's telling. And the next one, one over, chlorophyll fluorescence. What is that showing me? So chlorophyll aids the pigment in the algae. So that shows um, the algal, algal distribution in the water column, you know. So if you see over summer, like what's yellow, and you see like some red spots in there, it's when they accumulated. Of course, they migrate in that top surface of the water column. So sometimes they just get together and then you have higher densities, you know, but sometimes they're just yeah. like overgrown in the lake. Uh, um, yeah, so that shows all the density. You, you see that the last summer here, um, gen around January this year, We've had higher densities than the, the summer before. And we can, we've been capturing these variations with Lake Hay. There are years that you've got several blooms, and there are years that there it's a bit better. Um, but that, that, and then when we compare these data to turbidity and the nutrients, you know, like we, we start finding this relationship, you know, of algal growth and the availability of nutrients in the water, and then the water temperature when it's higher as well. So it all connects together. Just further, so, so that's really, really good, very good explanation. So you could produce a, you know, for a work plan going forward, could you actually produce a graph that gave you the right sort of mix in the water that would be the desirable for the correct species and everything you want to live in that? Yeah, so... O optimum levels. Sort of. um, I don't know if you've um, had a chance to see, but like in the paper I mentioned that... Um, we are working together with the University of Otago because there is no metric is at the moment required by the government that we should be looking with this type That's of data. Yeah. So we are developing some metrics that will um, um, define well 
what layers we have in the lake, you know, and where um, and then where we going to have like the highest nutrient levels and also um, with the chlorophyll, we're going to be able to see where they are and, and how the mixing should be as well, like in order to improve the lake. Um, what, there's like a big um, push from the from the Friends of Lake Hayes community at the moment, like on developing all the, the restoration strategy and they're doing a good job. Um, and I think we're going to be able to capture a lot of the changes with the with this equipment that we have at the moment. So we're going to be pretty much in near um, real time. You're going to be able to yeah. see if it's having an improvement or not. And then, um, of course, Otago Regional Council is also working on some options for um, restoration in the lake as well. So that that will, at the end, you know, it will come all together and then we're going to be be Thank able to measure the effectiveness of the measures that we are putting in place. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Hugo, that, those explanations. And thank you, Michael, for putting those questions. That was superb um, explanations. And uh, I think it's really, really exciting that Wanaka and how we are, or Wanaka and Wakatipu straight away, Wakatipu, and uh, how we are next year are getting these boys. So it's really good work. And looking forward to getting um, information from those boys. One question is, are there challenges? I mean, Lake Hayes is only 30-odd metres deep, and you've got you've put in there when that boy has had trouble yep. doing its job and stopping mm -hmm. um, because things are breaking down. How do you do that in lakes that are more than 300 metres deep and subject to short chops and really difficult conditions? Yep. Yeah. So uh, this, this is one of the factors that these technology is specific, because there are two boys out there here in New Zealand. One is like a string with several sensors at different depths, and these ones actually a winch with uh, a set of sensors that go up and down um, the water column. So with this technology, um, the company had only done um, up to 80 meters depth that was um, in Southland. And they were um, doing some trials, you know, to make sure that they could go deeper because we actually need to measure below the thermocline that, that layer of the temperature that stops the exchange of water. And then we are planning to go up to 130 meters and then we're gonna have fixed depth sensors as well at deeper layers. Um, measuring just the um, dissolved oxygen temperature. So, yes, that's a concern, um, you know, um, but he has had lots of boys in, in several lakes um, that will have similar conditions and it's been proven to be work, work um, nicely. With, with Lake Hayes, the problems that we've had in the last year was um, related to the hardware really, was not related to any um, yeah. Yeah, any um, external factor or weather conditions. Um, but with Wakatipo specifically, we had to, because the plan was having them both in our state of the environment sites, but then because our SOE site in Wakatipo is so exposed and, and get, gets very rough to the point that sometimes we cannot even go out and collect, depending on the day. So we, we decided to move to a more sheltered space just to avoid any disturbance, yeah. But um, yeah, that's something that we are taking into consideration anyway. I was just going to add to you guys, um, one of one of the reasons we haven't got the two in that we're planning for September yet is, is partly to do with making sure we're getting the design right for those um, greater depths as well as COVID. Um, so, and also I guess it also points to the point where Hugo was making before about let's get these two in, let's start getting data sets before we start um, nailing our um, flag to the mast about where exactly the next lot of uh, boys go. One very quick last question was, is there anything in this, and I don't think there is, I couldn't find anything, that measures actually what's at the very bottom of the lake or samples what's at the very bottom, heavy metals, etc. Yeah, so with this technology, as we're going to go up to 130, we're going to have um, strings with fixed depth sensors. So we will be measuring temperature and dissolved oxygen at the bottom of the lake. And as part of our um, nutrient sampling, we do um, collect samples for nutrients down at the bottom as well. So this will be yeah, showing a good picture Move. of what's going on in the bottom. The report. Thank you. Moved, Kevin. Seconded. Do you want to make a comment? I just want to pick up on Gary's point about uh, his bump or dint, what it, dint what it on, does. His, on his forehead. <laughs> I think it's important to remember um, that the number of uh, SOE 
monitoring sites has increased significantly over the last two or three years. I think off the top of my head it used to sit around about 70 and now it's 120 plus the boys or, or whatever. So I just think the Otago Regional Council are you know, stepping up in its core functions and uh, I think you know that's I'm, all I'm trying to balance your comments, Gary, and that's the way things were, but we're moving into a completely different space, and I and I think you know we're yeah we we're, we're just stepping up in those key areas of responsibility in terms of the environment. Very positive. Okay, so I have a mover and a seconder. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you, and thank you very much for that report. It was wonderful. We'll move on now to the <coughs> coastal uh, monitoring program. <laughs> Again, um, a really uh, cool report, and it's great to see this underway. It will eventually inform our coast plan, which comes into effect in 2028. You can see it's very costly and complex, and it's going to need good partnerships. So um, welcome, Sam Thomas. Can you tell us a bit more about this? What else do I have to say? Anything in particular? Oh, just, I think it's really worth um, seeing that, that uh, six-year process, but all the stages seem to get, the four stages seem to get underway within the next year, including a spatial plan, marine spatial plan, mapping and monitoring kelp forests and identification of knowledge gaps. And uh, one of the key things in this which may um, warm your heart, Kevin, uh, is that uh, we could recognise and maintain kelp forests and marine soft sediments as carbon sinks and start to recognise that. But you can tell us more about it. Thank you, Sam. Uh, yeah, that's kind of almost summarised oh, my introduction. So, but um, oh, no, no, essentially, oh, essentially, you. yeah. Over the next six <laughs> years, set up a, a pathway to a coastal monitoring program, as well as provide information for the um, regional plan coast review, which is going to start in 2024-25, and um, due in part to cost and also. Um, not having the knowledge out there, it's split into four parts. And the first part, some of these are running in parallel, the stages. So the first stage is undertaking the marine significant ecological area mapping, which will basically spatially map Otago's coast based on different criteria, um, RPS selection criteria, as well as the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. And that will allow us to find not only what's out there, but also knowledge gaps. And stage two, which sort of kicks off in parallel, is to create a cost-effective kelp forest monitoring program because we know about these ecosystems that are um, under threat and uh, they're important, so we don't need to wait for mapping to occur for them. And stage three is implementing this kelp forest monitoring program once we actually have a program design because it's quite complex to design a monitoring program for the coast. And... Um, Stage four is essentially utilising the marine spatial mapping to find the knowledge gaps and then try and fill them as well as create a uh, monitoring program based on what we get mapped by the marine significant ecological areas mapping is kind of, in a nutshell, the sort of process ahead. Thank you. So uh, Hillary and then Gretchen. Anybody else for questions? And Kevin, questions? Go Hillary. Just a wee question, same question as earlier. Um, how far do we go out? Uh, uh, Otago is, the coastal is? 1,200 miles. So that is the yeah. distance that it's assumed we've got some. Yeah, a jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah. So that could be what we could put back into our thing earlier. I'm just saying that that's... Okay, um, yeah, kind of like Gary before, this makes me probably the happiest I've ever been at council. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a big like, day. <laughs> <laughs> Make my day. Yeah, wow. of, um, yeah consistent approach, and it has been our um, well, requirement to monitor the state of the environment, including the coast and marine area. And then, yeah. Haven't done it, so yeah, uh, fantastic as well to see that collaboration because some people have done some really great work. Why not utilise that? It's a big job, <laughs> but yeah, you've got a, a good program in there, um, and probably yeah, it's answered most of the questions I think this report, except for um, 
how early would we actually have state of environment information sort of coming at us? <laughs> Hard to know, or you need to work through that. And the other one, uh, oh yeah, um, just if you are doing the kelp forest, which obviously might be a really good indicator and are a, um, a, a, a plant that's under threat, what about zostra, eelgrass, which often is said to be the same thing. We'll be picking some of it up in estuaries, but actually, actually would it be that much extra to be studying that, which is also probably equally as significant? Uh, so the first question around the state environment data back on that, um, that's quite difficult to know at this point, depending on how the network gets set up because as I think I mentioned with the collaboration, there's some data getting gathered out there through the uni, through the Taipori with the iwi there and then these marine reserves which are proposed and who knows when they're going to be implemented which then makes them DOC's responsibility to monitor and so hopefully we kind of fill in the gaps if you will in the key areas. So. Uh, yeah, I couldn't tell you when we'll know actual data. Hopefully, we'll start. We'll be hoping to fill in knowledge gaps after the mapping um, next financial year, which will highlight where we're missing some key areas, and then working with the uni and other groups in that space and try and fill in to get some baseline data to then start the network. But in terms of actual state of the environment, it's probably a, like a trend-wise, it's still a wee way off. Um, in terms of the Zostra. Uh, that's hopefully getting covered under the estuary program with the mapping is still kind of debated a lot of how that will work, like the kelp forest we're building on the stuff with uh, Lee Tate, which did for, for ORC with Port Otago with the consents monitoring. So there's already data there using satellite. The problem with the uh, seagrass is that's not really that useful at the moment, that method. So. Basically, we're trying to work out the best method. Well, when I say we, Niwa and Cawthron, to work oh, out okay. kind of the best method to monitor oh, yeah. that. But it is, yeah, with carbon storage and the habitat, I'm definitely. Thought I've thought of thought that. It's just uh, the method to kind of monitor it the best is still yeah. in development, I suppose. Thanks. Thank you. I've got uh, next is Kevin, then Kate, and then Michael Becker. Uh, yeah, I'm just excited and I haven't been here 10 years. <laughs> so, um, uh, look, I, I was um, unfortunately with a meal with Council of Laws not so long ago, and so I had to find something to talk about, and um, and he paid, so that was even better. But the, the, the fellow we were talking to was uh, uh, it was doing his uh, thesis or his master's or something this year on marine biology on pest plants uh, which uh, on the Otago coast, which leads to me where you've got your proposed coastal monitoring program for Otago and then item 26 it says you're going to use those what where can we and we've had uh, the varsity here looking for ways to collaborate so have, how do we help you get in there or do we need to and are you in there and how the, the, like there's got a huge resource and can we get in there and um, grab it it's actually a biosecurity question that one yeah. um, rather than a yeah. And so. also an MOU question. We've got a, yep. um, our teams developed an MOU with the university, and we're talking about those research projects that we can collaborate with and get student internships and those sorts of relationships going. Yeah. So that's all in development currently. Sorry, Gavin. Uh, the marine pathways work in a biosecurity context is in years two to three of the preferred biosecurity option. The other option had that commencing sort of immediately. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. And I can probably uh, uh, add to the collaboration that Julie mentioned. It helped doing my thesis through our uh, through our through Otago University. That I know the uh, most of the academics there pretty well, so I'm already kind of. Good, in contact with them about where we can fit in and work together. Thank you. Great stuff. Kate. Thank you. Um, really interesting report, and I'm sorry, I don't want to sound over try and overcomplicate it. This is all about the, um, the regional plan coast. As you do some of your monitoring, and maybe it's sediment issues or something else, will, or even E. coli, maybe around some bays where we've got septic tanks galore, um, would that necessarily or potentially inform the land and water plan and land use? Because if we don't, 
I'm, I'm just concerned that we may get some of this data presented too late to inform. We, we, we may want to act on it more quickly. Uh, so from the my, I suppose, Estuaries Coast portfolio, if you will, um, most of the land and water plan will be through the estuaries informing it from the coast side because I did I did actually ask a couple of the academics at Otago around the kelp or kelp forest because that's, you know, affected by sedimentation. But they said in terms of bringing that into land and water, it's just it's too complex environment to have any meaningful impact. He's essentially the two people I spoke to who are experts in kelp and that said whatever you can do to reduce sediment is going to be a benefit, but pinning it to any limits or any thing is it's there's too much current action and things happening to be able to say this is from land this okay. is from so from the coast side will be the estuary part will be all fed into the land and water plan thank you thank you Michael. can i just sorry can i just add one thing oh, to the sorry, first part um that kate said uh, we have two requirements mm -hmm. one is to inform policy but we also have a requirement to do S state of environment monitoring so it's not just about yeah. the coastal plan that's just yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. I don't know whether I should ask this or not, but I will. Um, Sam and Julie talking about collaboration and research and projects along the coast. One of the annual plan issues that this council has faced and is continuing to face is that of supporting the Alloy Penguin Trust with its scientific research program. And at the moment, we're inclined to think of doing it some other way or not at all. What advice would you give us about our continuing to invest in that research? Um, I personally, I think that's a real flagship um, for us. And I personally would love to see us continue to invest in the Yellow Eye Penguin Trust. That is um, one of our tāula, and I think we should be monitoring the environment and supporting, uh, supporting that, that population. Thank you. Any views, sir? Um, well, personally, I suppose the yellow penguin amongst all, I suppose, seabirds are indicator species, <laughs> so kind of monitoring, capturing seabirds as a whole, including penguins, whether it's with the Yellow White Penguin Trust or Birds New Zealand or the uni is quite an important part of the program. How that will play out is, I suppose, will be created over the next few years. Thanks. Could I advance Michael's question another step? Is there an opportunity with our work program where we could um, do some research that potentially the Yellow Eyed Penguin Trust was going to do in the future. Does that make sense? Um, possibly through the Indigenous Biodiversity. So I think the the principle, like I think Sam's done a really good job of trying to lay out, I guess, the method or the process by which he's going to do it, and some of the principles around partnership as well. So um, I, I guess I would be, I'd maybe put that question on hold until we've done the mapping and understanding what we think the gaps are and what we think the needs are before we make a decision about what we would fill in fill in, in terms of our own research before jumping to making decisions about particular research programs. Is that a fair? So as a, a stakeholder, the Yellow Eyed Penguin Trust would oh, yeah. be in our conversation further down the track once we came to a conclusion where our priorities were, and et cetera. Yep. Thank you. Before we get too far track, um, track of the next LCP, we'd like to um, move the two recommendations. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Yes. And as a seconder, someone. And Gretchen, thank you. And I'll put those recommendations. In. I don't think we want to talk to them. All in favour? Aye. Aye. It's carried. Okay, we've got four more items. Shall we have a five-minute break? Cool. Okay, we won't, we won't make moves, just have five minutes. We're back here at 22. Yep. Because we've got a lot to do. I doubt we can get through by four, but we've got to do something. How far through the key? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sobering reading again, this report. Most of Otago's freshwater sites have um, poor or fair long term grade. And, um, let's hear more about it. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, really, this, this is a report just on last season's contact rec program, which runs from the 1st of December to the end of March. It varies throughout New Zealand, but we have a shorter on, summer. Um, there's, there, I've presented all the results, um, including what, what's presented on Lawa. Um, it should be noted that the way that the long-term grade is presented on Lawa will be changing in the next season, um, and it will be presented as a donut, probably. So it shows you the proportion of exceedances rather than just a great big red flag. Um, and I think the paper says it all, so I'm happy to take the questions. Ryan? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, just following on from, you know, Madam Chair's intro. I mean, firstly, this is just E. coli, yeah. So it's just sort of part of the spectrum of, of, of water quality, yeah. I mean, like, we don't talk about nitrogen or... But it's all E. coli. When you look at page 61 <coughs> of the 230 pages, it does go through the freshwater sites. And as Madam Chair said, between 2015 and 2020, uh, they've all been either non-applicable, poor or fair, and the one excellent at Lake Harwea. Although when you, you go to the 2020-21 results, <coughs> Um, if you look at the menu here at Kia, for example, where it had 15 cautions and six unsuitable for swimming in the five-year period, but now there's 19 cautionary and zero unsuitable for swimming. So maybe there's an improvement there. And so my question is, you know, is there an improvement? Or is, if you compare that with Tari at Waipiata, for example, it, it's actually getting worse. So my question is, have I interpreted that correctly? And what are the learnings from it? I think it's quite dangerous to compare just one season with another season because okay. contact recreations, particularly bacteria, yeah. is absolutely rainfall dependent. Is that so abs absolutely, apart from the odd occasion. But um, on the whole, if you have a wet season, you're going to get way more um, high elevated enterococci or E. coli results. So we're not looking at a trend here at all. Right. We're just looking at the five year is meant to indicate whether generally it's suitable for swimming or not. And that's one set of results. And then the last season is just what actually happened in the last season. So you can look at both, but you, you shouldn't really compare year on year on year because, as I said, it's rainfall. Okay, but so why is the report, Madam Chair, why hasn't it actually said that? Like, so in paragraph 36, it says most of the targets freshwater sites are poor or fair long grade, whereas Hawaii has an excellent grade. You know, so why hasn't it said that this is subject to rainfall and needs to be treated with caution? Well, I usually do put that in my reports. Perhaps I didn't that time, but contact recreation and E. coli um, is quite dependent on rainfall. Some councils in the past yeah. haven't bothered sampling in wet weather because they know yes. that the results will be elevated. Okay. Um, Otago Regional Council has always um, sampled weekly <laughs> and actually now that's a requirement of the MPSFM that we have to sample whether it's rained mm. or not. Um, and in fact we chose not to one week this year because we had that horrific rainfall, do you remember, on the 1st of January uh, when everything was in flood so actually that was a health and safety <clears throat> thing. Thank you. Gary? Yeah, I can see that you'd want to do them consistently week on week on week all year. Would you, is it possible to sort of sit, put an asterisk beside the ones that we're actually um, 
times that it isn't a sort of a, a time when you'd have put a notice up saying it's been raining yesterday or today or, or whatever it is and don't don't swim here. You know, but people usually who know about swimming wouldn't even attempt to. And and so can we put them in there but asterisk them with a, this is not, you know. And the big problem here, oh, that would be lovely if we could sample every day, for example, and get a E. Yeah. coli result every day. Oh, no, I just so mean if you're doing it weekly, occasionally it will be times okay. when... It'd have to be cracked in the head to and, even. And the problem there is that the results are always retrospective. So you sample on a Monday, you get the result on a Wednesday. It might have rained on a Wednesday, so the result might be really good. But by the time the result appears, it's rained. and it, So it's nonsense, really. Um, but, it's, <laughs> but if you, you're doing them week on week, yes. then the proportion of the time that they're poorly that it matters, I, matters if, you, if you know what I mean. If you've got 50 over a year, wouldn't you, wouldn't you at least tell people that five of these 50 or only one of these 50 was? So I think that's a generic, that generic advice on Lawa is there in terms of rainfall events. Um, and the other thing I said, I think, is um, that was Rachel was talking about in terms of trying to look at across seasons and understand the likelihood um, of an occurrence is also an indicator for people as well in terms of would you swim or not. And there are some signs around, the one Queensland Bay. So there's signs at, at, every, at every contact rate site. And when oh, I, when the long-term grade is what really people are looking at, and that's been recognised that it's not, um, it's, when, you, when you long-term grade poor is quite uh, an alarming fact to be faced with straight away. So which is why it's likely to be changed to a proportion of the time, as you were saying, that the site yeah. isn't suitable for swimming, a proportion of the time it's suitable, a portion of the time it's cautionary, which will give yeah. people a much better understanding of the overall... Yeah. Especially if it's yeah. during a time of year one might be swimming. Yeah. With the contact rec season, it's <laughs> only during the time yeah. that yes. people yeah, so will be that's swimming. The, yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, contrary to the introduction by the chair, I actually thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, which I suppose is the question, this is a very positive report for this year. If you look at the season we've had, which has been a dry season with a massive rainfall right in around early in the new year, so we're not talking a small rainfall, a huge rainfall that we had right across the region, then when you look at the numbers and the percentages of dates across that four month period as unsuitable for swimming, so this I'm on page 61 of the table, which is probably the crux of the whole report, I would have thought we had a really, really good result for this year. I mean, Lawa and its ratings, I think, are a nonsense over the five years. But when you look at this year alone and the percentages there, I thought that's really positive. Right, Councillor Scott referenced the Manuhira Care. 19% was cautionary. 81% was fine for swimming. Um, most of those others, Central Otago ones, are sitting in around 100%. Uh, I thought that was really good news. Am I wrong? I'm presenting the facts. <laughs> I don't think my question's been answered. Well, it's, I think it's, uh, that's your interpretation. Yeah. What's there, rather than something anyone can answer? I think if you remember the swimmability targets that this council set for itself, which I think were some at the time. We wanted them to be aspirational, and they were somewhere in the, I think it was 19, maybe 99 for lakes and 95 for everything else. Yeah, some of those results aren't quite stacking up. Some are, but some aren't. But by and large, given the extent of that rainfall, if we didn't have that rainfall, it might have been a slightly different scenario, but as we drill into... Because we are getting into or towards a land use plan towards we're going to use water quality results as some direction potentially, then um, to me for this season alone having experienced that heavy rainfall, having looked at the season, I would have thought by and large across this we would be able to say yes this is a very positive outcome. But may, maybe that's just me as one of 12. Michael Laws and then Kevin. 
So, so if, taking me to that freshwater swimming graph that is on page 61, <clears throat> and I guess the ones with the red things are meant, are red for a reason, they're meant to alarm us and say, hey, that's not good. Um, I know I shouldn't be asking this question, but I'm going to. <laughs> What are you going to do with that information, or is that for us to determine now? No, we're just accepting the report. No, that's, that's yeah. exactly the point I'm so, trying to make. So uh, you are just receiving a report. Um, this is a recreational uh, con or contact sampling um, report. This is what happened uh, last summer, with some indication of what happened previous summers. Um, just want to be clear, it is not our SOE water quality report. It is a very different thing, a very different beast. Um, so you can make decisions and resolutions, but just keep that in mind when you're, when you're doing that. This is an advisory service for people who want to go swimming. Okay, but nevertheless, um, if I was looking at this, I'd be going <gasps> um, at Otakaya Creek. Otokaya Creek and um, Tairi River at Wai Waipiata, I think. Is and Kakanui. Right? Kakanui. Yeah. yeah. So, Kakanui. So Rachel will speak more to this, but when we get E. coli exceedances, in some cases we do the fecal source tracking to identify where the, what the E. coli source is. Um, do you want to speak more to that, Rachel, or do you want to carry on? No, no, no. I, I can speak more to that, but yeah. the... When... At particular sites, we know on occasion there's elevated bacteria levels, so we take duplicate samples that are um, that can be fecal source tracked, meaning that they can indicate whether it's a there's a human element, whether there's a ruminant element or an avian element. But it's not quantitative; it's just whether these things are present. Um, so, in that table, um, we. For Otokia Creek, if that's how you pronounce it, um, and Waipiata, we fecal source tract at those two sites. We don't fecal source tract at every site. We make that decision before the season starts. So we have a lot more information on those two sites than we did do last year. Can I maybe add, so that, that's uh, a process we do within the season in terms of advisory service and putting those um, advices up. There's also... Correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel. Under the MPSFM, the new MPSFM, there is attributes for which we're required to do action plans, and this is this is is one of those action, one of those attributes. Thank you. Well, I've got one, one. Oh, sorry, one question because it sort of raises the next question for me about how we select the things that you might be put off swimming by. So yeah. Fecal content probably is pretty much up there. Yeah, I can understand that one. But in Lake Wanaka, for example, one of the big issues is lake snow and the clawing and clingy and horrible sensation that that provides. Is there anything that gives... We don't measure that at all in, in our swimmability? No, we do monitor, as, as well as fecal bacteria, we look at clarity and we look at um, cyanobacteria. And those three things are um, considered the most important for swimmability because obviously if it's quite turbid, you can't see where you're going. And if it's toxic, it speaks for itself. Um, I understand that late snow is annoying, um, but it's in a sort of different category. And that's something that we could, we could look at. Okay, thank you. Evan. No, I'm good, thanks. Anybody else? Oh. I was just going to say I'm happy to move when you Thank want you. it, but yes, I actually, well, I'm happy to move now, but I actually thought, and I should have probably done this under Lake Boys, and with the leave of you, I know that we've only allowed to do certain things at this meeting, but it would be a nice time to acknowledge the work of um, Dame Carolyn Burns yes, um, and to congratulate her, and I, maybe the chair could do that, but the very reason that we've got a lot of science behind this stuff now is because of a lot of the fundamental work I think that she's led in us un understanding and appreciating the fresh water qualities in New Zealand. Um, and it's great to see that she was acknowledged at the Queen's birthday. Would you like to put that in? As part of that motion, yes. To, that, um, we are, uh, congratulations, send our congratulations to her. I don't think that's overstating her contribution to it. And 
So you'll put that. Do I have a seconder? Seconder. Andrew, thank you. Thank you. And uh, all in favour? Aye. Aye. You should write the letter, Andrew. Thank you very much, um, Rachel. Really thank you. And thank you. Um, so I had a quiet Brighton, it's all birds. Okay, so yeah, birds, um, yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my view. Yeah, at least half of them are exactly there. Yeah. And it's birds all the time. Okay, so now yeah, we're up to the worst. Just the worst. Yeah, see if we can find it. On page 84. Yeah, so uh, to note, excuse me. Yeah, so Oh, it's okay, let's just move on now. We're on to the next one. To note that we're asked 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 to note that we're Sounds like it's about housing to me. I've got a house. Yes, but it's only the same as the Good management of that. I thought you were just read your fresh But as you see, Philip, that's fine. So, yes, just wanted to introduce Philip Waters, who has now joined Kyle um, to make up two people in our Urban Growth and Development I team. I recognise Kyle, but I looking down. <laughs> so, that's just, this is Philip's first time in front of Kyle. Thank you, Gwyneth. Um, so this paper is, um, as you noted, it's for noting. Um, in March, you have presented an initial um, urban monitoring report that provided a range of information um, outlining some key trends in development um, data relating mm. to housing supply, housing demand and housing affordability. Um, that was to discharge responsibilities under the NPS urban development. Um, that required that this information continues to be monitored on a quarterly basis and um, this report provides the first quarterly update um, and it's a more slimmed down version of, of the um, data um, of the data. Uh, what we've not done is we haven't repeated any information where there's no updated data available. Um, we've extended some time series data sets and we've also provided some new data sets which we've um, managed to obtain um, in order to provide you with the most up-to-date information that we have available. It's anticipated that at the point we get to the full year um, cycle, um, a more full report will be presented again um, that, that covers a, a wider range of topics and provides more detailed analysis. Um, so the, the, the attached report provides a range of information which I won't talk to all of. Um, it, it, um, essentially, some of the new information that's provided is there are um, Statistics New Zealand presented rebased population projections um, that reflected on the results of the 2018 census, um, and that confirmed um, ORC's expectations about population growth in the across the region, which were used in the long-term plan population projections. Um, so we, we can be confident that Statistics New Zealand believe we're, we're relatively closer to um, the expected population growth uh, than the, the 2016 base projections indicated population growth would be. So that's that's a good news story. Um, in terms of housing price growth, um, the most recent information will come as no surprise. Um, house price growth across the region has gone bananas over 2020 to 2021, yeah. approximately 20% on average across the region. Um, and there's also some additional information relating to long-term changes in rents and house price growth um, dating back 20 years or so. And that just shows that um, typically house price growth is um, more volatile from year to year than rental growth. But over the longer term, um, value growth is significantly more than in, in terms of property values than in terms of rental growth. Thank you very much. Questions first, Michael Laws. Anybody else then, Michael Deeker? I don't want to upset my friend, Michael, on this one. But I'm looking at a graph on page 100, and I think it's 14 of this particular thing, and it is that projected population change. And I'm looking at the graph and I'm thinking that can't be right, and it's figure seven. Is figure seven suggesting, as I think it's suggesting, that every year for the next 25 years, well, every five years, for every the next 25 years, Queenstown will grow its population greater than Dunedin, 
and that central Otago will almost match it. Is that what those figures are showing? Yes, that's correct. Um, that's the net additional amount so that's of... The, that's the actual numbers. It's not... No, the it's the change. It's the change. It's the change, yeah. 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 They, they, they are all net additional um, at those points, um, 2023 to 2028. So... In, in DCC, for example, that's almost 5,000 additional people um, at the year 2023 to present. So that would suggest that in the next 25 years, that, that sort of whole Dunstan area of central Otago, Queenstown, is the population is going to sort of shift there in a funny sort of way. It, it suggests that's where the, the greatest rate of growth will be. Um, Dunedin will continue to be the largest population centre, but it will not be growing by such a large factor on an annual basis. Okay, um, who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Thanks, um, Madam Chair. I note that the report is a requirement of the NPS Urban Development 2020, um, and that, of course, is an RMA requirement. Um, but I wonder who the audience is for this. I mean, us, obviously. You presented the report to this committee. Does anybody else require to have it on their files? Well, um, Queenstown Lakes and Dunedin both produce their own similar reports um, because they are tier two urban environments. Um, our role is to provide a regional picture, um, which will be helpful for them in understanding um, the regional picture of anticipated growth. Um, no district is, a, is an island and um, housing market areas and labour market areas do bleed across. Um, so it's, we consider it's helpful for them to prepare um, for growth across the region um, and anticipate the impact of development in one part of Otago on another part of Otago. Can I just add something in here? We were discussing today, and when does this committee want to receive each quarter? Go straight to the actually have I, 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 I found it interesting. I found it interesting. Uh, particularly the regional aspect of it. But I was when I first read this, I was wondering. What our, whether our sources of information were any different to that which the media uses all the time, because God knows we get enough stories about real estate. Uh, and I find that it's a mixture of uh, TLA data sets and data from the Real Estate Institute. Uh, or have I oversimplified that? Is there some other source of this data? Statistics New Zealand is a significant oh, Zealand as well. provider yeah. of the information yep, okay. that we're reporting. Yep. No, um, no more questions. That's right. About that. um, Kate and then Brian. Thank you. Um, just uh, the cumulative um, population growth that's suggested in the graphs that Michael Laws was uh, referring to, which means that Queenstown Lakes, and I just want to get the data. So this came. When were these figures? Because it starts at 2018. Are these relatively new figures from Stats New Zealand? That, yes, so they, they were published in April, um, okay. and they are their growth projection that takes account of it's rebased from the 2018 census. So, in actual fact, there were more people living in Otago um, in 2018 than since New Zealand anticipated there would have been yep. when they projected forward from the last census. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, that's interesting. They are just a projection, they're not necessary. Absolutely. Um, whether or not they will be borne out will be will be proved over time, but um, that's <coughs> what they believe to be the, the, the most um, likely assumption. This is the median scenario. They produce a, a spectrum, and typically they found that their median scenario is the closest to what actually happens if you, if you go back over in time to see what they projected. 20 years ago, their medium scenario has typically been the closest to what actually eventuated. So um, whilst we can't say whether or not this will be borne out, um, it's the, the, the best available information. OK, thank you. Brian. Um, on page 92, um, figure 1C, it, it shows that in 2018, the net migration for Dunedin City went up 7,000. It was quite a spike. And then it's projected to sort of fall off. 
right through for the next period of time. So what do we know what factors actually drive, drive that spike? Immigration. I, I mean, the, the two colours indicate um, the extent to which that is natural increase, as in um, more births than deaths, or whether that's migration driven. That graph shows that a large proportion of the population growth was migration driven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, was that from within New Zealand? Was it from external from New Zealand? Was it because of immigration policy? Was it due to exchange rate? Was it due to COVID? It won't be COVID. Um, what was because we spend a lot of time trying to drive population growth. Mm -hmm. It'd be quite nice to just have it crystallised how we ex how it was achieved. Yeah, yeah, so uh, Statistics New Zealand doesn't break down the components of net migration uh, below the national level, um, but there was a significant international migration peak in that year, uh, and uh, that was also the year I moved to Dunedin from Auckland. So um, counted in there somewhere. So maybe if, <laughs> if Dunedin, because we spend a lot of money, or Dunedin City does, trying to drive population increase. If they want to drive it, they really need to do hand in hand with the central government in terms of well, national immigration. Ultimately, in New Zealand, all cities are competing for the same number of migrants. Uh, what drives migration is the relative difference between where people are and where they want to go to. So they go to the sun. That's right. So <laughs> some people will move <laughs> yeah, to the, the retirement belt, uh, the sun belt, uh, Taronga Eastern Seaboard, for example, um, and arguably. Queenstown and the Lakes districts uh, north and south of there also offer a similar amenity driver to that as well. So uh, Dunedin did have a massive spike, um, as did all the districts um, in 2018. Yeah. Um, and that was probably a combination of a little bit of, um, I guess, uh, house price flight from other parts of New Zealand, um, as well as, as a huge uh, peak in um, international migration as well. OK, thank you. Uh, Kevin, um... No, look, I was just going to say, the fact that you did arrive in that peak and then all of a sudden it slowed off, you've got nothing to do with that, have you? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's right. Okay, can I'm we sure um, receive this I'll report? Move. I'll move Andrew That's and right. Kate, thank you. Assuming you don't need to talk to it. And all in favour? Aye. Thank you. If I could, it, it's really interesting. I, I find it really, really interesting, but I just wonder if there's any way that we can, within Otago, just have one group doing this, and then whether, I, don't, I wouldn't worry me whether it was uh, Queenstown doing it, or us doing it, or whoever's doing it, that we only have one one set of that documentation, and then perhaps we sell it to the others. You know, it just seems to, it just seems to be, put, you know, if everyone's doing it, well, we're just duplicating, and, and it just all goes on the same well, bunch of rate yeah. bars, doesn't it? That's right. Well, we, well we can talk about that. But thanks. We have to do it anyway under the. Yeah, yeah, no, we have to do it, but you, you only need. Um, it, it's all from the same sources. So why aren't we just doing one and flick it out to everyone? Yeah. At a cost or whatever. You know what I mean? And save everyone some. Some money. Yeah, yeah, Thanks very much, team. Excellent well, plan, Kevin. Move motion. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm working on a few of them. <laughs> Moving on to 7.6, active faults yeah, yeah. as a need to include the district. I see. As well as to inform the committee of the outcome of the GNS science review of active faulting and folding. And Dunedin City and Clutha. I found it absolutely fascinating, the report, actually, looking at that and seeing new lines on here which weren't there before. Shall <laughs> Jean-Luc, Gavin... There's not many going to YTT, but you notice in that graph. Yeah. We're not going to do this, just steady, just steady. Hi. Once we get the stage no, built, it's built. Really I'm David Barrow, I'm the author of the report. Ah, oh, thank you very much, <coughs> yes. David Barrow. Sorry, yes, nice um, you, yeah, you. good afternoon. Um, David Barrow has authored the um, Active Faults in the Clutha and Dunedin City Districts report, which is the final report in a series of um, updating Otago's active faulting um, mapping for our natural hazards database and then for future work on natural hazards relating to seismic hazard in Otago. And David has a few slides that he can take you through to just describe the background of the report. Lovely, thank you. Fascinating report. Got in your hands. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the information in the report addresses the faults of the uh, Clutha and Dunedin districts. Um, 
But I guess just a few slides here will just underscore some of the significance of, of how we should regard that. Um, first of all, to highlight that um, much of eastern and southern Otago uh, lies within a very low seismicity zone. So within the general um, concentration of earthquake activity in New Zealand, we are um, off the main area of activity. And in fact, we have levels of uh, frequency of earthquakes here um, only really seen elsewhere in the north north of Auckland. So, so we're in a low seismicity zone and the, um, the map with all the red dots just shows one year of seismicity for shallow earthquakes in New Zealand. So we're um, they're, they're very infrequent here, as we as we all know. Um, uh, this is just one of the uh, maps from the report, and 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 I, and I guess to to highlight a, a feature which is perhaps advantageous to Otago compared to Canterbury is that most of the uh, fault lines. Um, are quite evident in the landscapes. We can sort of see where they are. They're actually lying along the foots of the ranges that have been uplifted by the fault movements. Um, and so, by and large, we can see them in the landscape really well, as opposed to the Canterbury Plains, for example, where many of the faults which are potentially active are buried underneath gravel, and so we can't see where they are. And that's where the uh, 2010 Darfield earthquake was quite a surprise, because we didn't know that fault was sitting there suddenly appeared beneath the flat plain. And so one of the things of Otago is at least we can see where most of these things are, and that just gives us a step ahead in knowledge. Um, this is just an example to illustrate uh, you know, how plain they are to see. This is the Hyde Fault, um, it, it, it separating the Rock and Pillar Range, uplifted along the fault from the Strathtyre Plain, and so it's... it's uh, um, yeah, it's 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 a lovely example of such a <coughs> such a feature. Um, this is a, a a trench excavated across the Hyde Fault. Uh, this is work from Otago University PhD student, um, and it just shows what these things looked like on the ground. In this case here, um, the fault runs through the middle of the of, of the scene. It's uplifted on its left hand side and pushed up. Uh, stream gravels up against beds of silt. Um, we can date the offset, lay offset and non-offset layers, and so the study has indicated that the Hyde Fault at that location has moved twice in the last 23,000 years, and the most recent one was about 10,000 years ago. For example, and, and, and I guess to highlight that that's an example of one of the more active faults of Otago. I mean, it, it, it sounds particularly infrequent. It is pretty infrequent, but it's um, there are many less active faults than that. Um, this is an investigation on the Tea Tree Fault, which uplifts the range of hills along the seaward side of the Tyree and Tokamariro basins. We uh, dug a trench across that and got a very very similar story, um, evidence for two large earthquake offsets in the last 38,000 years, and the most recent one was more than 18,000 years ago. So we're, through these investigations, building a more quantitative picture of um, what's been going on. So I guess just to give this some context, because you look at a map of what's in these reports and you might look at a previous report and think, well, there's a whole lot more than there were before. Um, so part of that is to do with definitions and how we define what is an active fault and what, you know, within um, how we describe the level of activity. <coughs> Until a decade or so ago, there were only about six faults that were recognised as active in Otago. Um, but we also knew that there was a certain amount of compression due to the plate movement that had to be distributed across Otago. And so that was apportioned on those six faults. Um, in many cases, it made them appear more active than even the landforms along them would suggest. So that just, just from even the, the landform appearance and how the uh, steps from past movements look in the landscape, 
it seemed unreasonably large rates of movement were put on these faults. Um, perhaps the key, one of the most important pieces of science in earthquake science in New Zealand was done by some colleagues of mine, published about five years ago. They did a review of all the large historical earthquakes in New Zealand, so since 1850 or so, and then assessed how many of them occurred on faults that we would call active, based on, on the defini definitions we use today. And it's about half. And so that has really underscored that how we've been defining and regarding <coughs> faults as active or not is um, not robust, it, it, it just, it's just not up to scratch. Um, taking that on board, what we've now done is to, to look at all of the major faults that, have, that, that show expression in the landscape, which means that there's been movement of many tens or hundreds of metres over perhaps millions of years, and regard them as potential candidates for moving again, even though we wouldn't call them active by the criteria we've been using. We, we, we think, well, it's those faults that are accounting for half historic earthquakes that we <clears throat> wouldn't previously recognise. So what we've done, and, and this is we've, we've done this for all of the um, district projects for Otago. So we did Waitaki some years back, Central Otago um, and Queenstown Lakes, and now these last two districts we've brought all of those faults that we, we can recognise into the frame. And many of them, we see no signs of recent activity, and so they're obviously ones which don't move very often. But we've given them a little bit of, a little bit of movement rate, very small. Um, but when you do that to all of those faults and then assign activity rates to the faults which have obviously had some more recent movements, such as the Hyde or the Tetri fault, it actually comes out to the same number we had before, spread across the six faults. When you actually put the, the rates that fit the evidence onto the 29, or, or when you consider all of the Targo, the 60, 70 faults, it actually comes out to be about the same. So I think, I think what we've been able to do now is give a... We've given a more solid foundation to... Um, earthquake science and how we regard faults as source, sources of earthquake in Otago. And also really good news is that that's now being brought into a national framework. So New Zealand's had a national seismic hazard model, which, which is a, a model by which we can assess what's the likelihood of certain levels of earthquake shaking in any particular part in the country. We've had... Uh, a model developed over the last two decades. Our uh, last update was almost a decade ago. Um, and that just dealt with in Otago, those six faults that we would have had before. So now we're bringing a whole lot more faults into the frame um, and treating them as fits the evidence better. I think we'll um, have a much more solid framework for going forward. And so all of the work that's been done for the Otago Regional Council um, by us, and this is the last report in the series, all of that will be going into the national model in uh, the next year or two. Fascinating. That's a really interesting report. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Anybody? Brian? I'm showing my ignorance here, but I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, the relationship between all the faults, you know, and so for example say there was a, a mega eight, there's apparently a 70% chance of an over mega eight earthquake coming out of central Otago and going up the west coast and going across to Christchurch and if that went off, how does it sort of interrelate, you know what's the connection between all these and what's the impact on Dunedin and Otago? Yes, so um, the the the, uh, the magnitude eight earthquake, which we've you know we've seen a lot about the media, that yeah. refers to the Alpine Fault, yeah. which runs from round numbers from Milford Sound <coughs> yeah. along the western side of the Southern Alps, yeah. sort of, uh, through French Joseph and on up towards Nelson. So, but it also goes across to the Christchurch towards Christchurch. No, 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 Doesn't no. So it, it, that's the line of the fault, but but and, and the difference is that a magnitude eight earthquake on that fault is going to give shaking, which is felt more widely. So it's, it's actually the shaking from the earthquake which will affect I see. here 
here in Dunedin will feel that, in Christchurch they'll feel that quite strongly. So it's actually the shaking that's got the wide footprint, but the actual fault, the actual fault that causes it is, 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 is a narrow line over on the west coast. So, so that's the that's the sort of the difference between the, the feature which moves to cause the earthquake and then how widely the earthquake is felt. So the, 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 those are the two components. Um, we know that the Alpine Fault is uh, the most active fault in New Zealand. Where there's, there's been some fantastic scientific work done. Um, they dug a trench, a bit like what I showed you there, um, over on the west coast and got the last 8,000 years of movement and they could radiocarbon date every earthquake, every fault rupture there. Um, every 300 years? Every 300 years. And it's not quite clockwork. It can be as short as 200, it can be as long as 400. Um, but that's the closest we can come to earthquake prediction is that the Alpine Fault's going to do that again and we're now 300 years since the last did it. So we're right <coughs> in the frame of frame of not to be surprised when it happens. That's the most active one. So we know that does that frequently. Every other fault that we've looked at across New Zealand <coughs> moves much less frequently. So, so um, there are a few which might move every one or 2,000 years on average. They're pretty active. But that's still only one movement per several alpine fault movements. So that tells us that when the alpine fault moves, other faults don't go off in sympathy all the time. Something in the odd one might, but, but by and large they're, they're quite independent entities. And, and so there's an, an independence between the two of them. <coughs> and of course the, the, the thing of importance is that when you look at a, the maps that we have here, there are potentially active fault lines in many places throughout all of the eastern South Island and potentially any of those. If, if, if any one of those were to move and move enough to break the ground surface, we're in the realm of magnitude 7 earthquake at that location. Um, so even though they move infrequently, if they were to move, then they will have significant effects at that locality. Thank you very much, Hilary. Speaking of moving, I'm happy to. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. We've got um, four things we're doing. Receiving the report, noting the information we publicly available, as we provided to Dunedin City and Cooper Districts, and directs that a report be provided to the Strategy and Planning Committee by 31st of December this year on options for incorporating the information when it needs to be incorporated. Seconded. Seconded. Thank you, Gary. And uh, I put the motion. All in favour? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very, very yes. much. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, You've added to my new words of the day. Which word have I added? You've added four or five of them. <laughs> Def deformation, uh, yeah. seismicity, locationally accurate at different <laughs> scales, <laughs> and monocline. <laughs> and I don't think I picked them all up by any chance. So the purpose is uh, simply to update us on the performance of public transport. Um, you've got quite a lot of information there, and Julian has a little bit of extra information that's come in recently, he's going to put as well. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, correct. So, uh, in your hands. Thank you. Okay, so... Um yeah, the report, the initial bit of the report compares uh, patronage uh, for this financial year versus the previous financial year. Um, however, the we're getting into, in terms of comparison, at this point last year, we're getting into a month and a half of COVID. So um, we, uh, you know, at this point last year, we had free travel, various forms of lockdown, uh, reduced COVID timetables, uh, free super gold peak travel, and of course this year we've introduced a, the $2 flat fare as well. Um, so what I brought to the pre-meeting yesterday, and I understand is in your electronic packs now, I've got some paper ones if anyone doesn't have it, is a comparison that, having done a bit of a round table with other regional councils, of um, this year versus our last full year where there wasn't any COVID, which gives a truer picture of where we're at for Dunedin and Queenstown um, in the sort of post-COVID environment. 
and also a uh, comparison to um, to some other regions who've uh, provided some data to us. So if we look at Dunedin to start with, um, comparing the financial year to date, we're actually at 106%, so a 6% higher than uh, we were on the 2018-19 <coughs> Uh, financial year, which is the, uh, as far as I'm aware, the strongest uh, performance in the country. Uh, every region that we're aware of that's provided data is at below the 100% so they've experienced a fall. I haven't seen Wellingtons. And noting that the three examples I've put on the table, which are Auckland at 62%, Taranaki at 89 and Horizons at 64 um, was part of a, a kind of semi-official figures, but figures that were in a, a roundtable email discussion rather than pulled out of a report. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, and we had some feedback this morning in a meeting then ZTA as well, uh, Dunedin appears to be the strongest performing uh, network in the country. Um, Queenstown, as might be expected, um, uh, due to the impacts of COVID on the area, is not uh, performing. Uh, it's performing similarly to Auckland, at, uh, so it's dropped. So we're at 60% of where we were in the previous uh, non-COVID financial year, um, year to date. Um, if we were to sort of extrapolate where we are at the moment, um, so the last full pre-COVID financial year, 2018-19, we had overall patronage across the entire network of 4 million trips approximately. We'd be looking at around 3.6 million trips if we continue in our current trajectory, um, and that drop is entirely um, uh, because of the effect on the the Queenstown um, network. Um, there are uh, there is one interesting stat in the um, in the Queenstown data which I've presented, which is the uh, Routes, routes three and four slash five, which are, I guess, the less, um, uh, you could say, touristy oriented routes, uh, are actually experiencing some growth, um, despite uh, large downturns in, in the other routes. So um, you could argue that the commuter services are actually doing reasonably well um, in comparison to the rest of the, uh, of the Queenstown network. Um, we expect uh, performance to improve significantly as COVID gradually, uh, hopefully, gets uh, wiped out and tourism returns to the area. Pre-COVID, our biggest problems were not being able to, ha not having sufficient capacity even on some of the services, the airport service in particular, the Route 1, because there were too many people using it at peak times. So we're not at that stage at the moment, but it just shows that the, the effect that COVID and tourism has had on um, on that area. But on the other side of the coin, Dunedin is performing very strongly. Um, we should bear in mind that we are um, in a $2 fair trial period. So that may, is likely to have had an effect on, um, on patronage. Uh, but even taking that into account, um, being 6% up on uh, our previous full pre-COVID year is, is still a very strong performance. But you know, pricing is important, but it's not the only driver of people onto the bus service. Um, yeah, are there any questions on patronage? Michael then Kate. Yeah, um, through you, Madam Chair, but excellent numbers um, for Dunedin and Julian. And it occurs to me that as well as the factors you've talked about, like the $2 fare trial, We've also got the B card as against the Go card. Yeah. And I wonder whether that better data collection might be improving the stats a wee bit. Um, so I don't think the data collection uh, would affect the overall stats because the previous system, although it had its limitations, the, the raw data that came through um, was still uh, accurate. Um, but I think the fact that we have the B card might be encouraging people to use the service who wouldn't have used it previously because the Go card was comparatively pretty cumbersome. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Thank you. Um, thanks. Yeah. Um, 
Um, great report, and I've learnt lots. And unfortunately, all it's done is make me want to ask more questions, um, which I'm not quite sure we're going to have a time for today, or b we can nut out. But if I picked on Queenstown because I've been there recently looking at their bus services, and what this tells me is a growth, and um, or you alluded to some areas having the commuter routes going up. Yeah. What I can't see is on that relatively long arrow town right round to. Whatever route that is, three. Mm? Uh, yeah, yeah. Where the what the numbers are on each part of that, or can I see oh, you that? I mean from Arrowtown to Queenstown. To Queenstown, and then goes through. I mean, there's one that goes to um, that sort of route almost goes all the way through to Arthur's Point, I think. It goes to Arthur's Point, yes, yeah. correct, yeah. So what I can't, I can see the numbers, what the numbers are like on that whole route. Yep. What I can't see is what it's like on parts of those routes and whether, because what I'm thinking is that there may be parts that actually, if we put on more services, for example, there may be a higher demand, not necessarily for the whole route, for part of that yep. route. When, so when is it appropriate that we understand that level of, um, the, you know, I know that the community have asked for us to be flexible and understand yep. these things. At what level do we get down to understanding the service and what we could be doing? So the new ticketing system gives us the ability yeah. to drill down to that level of detail, uh, even down to particular periods of the day. Yeah. So if there was a particular specification that the data committee or council would want to see a report on, it's not a report we've done in that level of detail at this stage. It wouldn't be tremendously complicated for us to put something together for Queenstown and looking at individual routes and popular sections of route and that sort of thing. So we could put that together. Great. Thank you. Okay, next, Ms. Louie. Um, just missing, and I probably just can't see it, the um, gold card stuff. What page am I? Usage of gold card. All right, so on uh, there's uh, some graphics for Dunedin and uh, Queenstown, and the figure four... Uh, so what page? Sorry. Uh, I haven't got the full report in, in front of me. I'm not sure it's 215. <clears throat> so it's a percentage rather than a figure, but um, there's a split okay. on the top right of the table by concession okay. type. So for Dunedin, the Super Gold is 18%, and uh, Queenstown, uh, 3%. Okay, but we don't know any changes of that. Um, we don't have a change track, but again, it's something we do track, so we can put that into the report if you want for the next one. Yeah, because it would be interesting to know of those categories which are going up. You know, mm. if if they're going up or we're doing the yeah. right thing, which ones of those categories are we doing it for? I mean, that matters because some people clearly like... Um, for a child, there's been suggestions that we're charging too much for a child in comparison to a ha half of a yep. grown-up, and, and that, of course, the old people, and I can only say that because I'm one of them, um, who don't have to pay, it's all very well encouraging yep. more of them to use the bus, which is safer than us running them over and things. But um, Yeah, and look, it's not, again, we can put together a report showing tracking the various concession types from the introduction of the B card to date. Yeah, that would yeah, be that good. We can do that definitely 100%. Thank you. Um, so go going back to the, the patronage figures that you gave us on yep. the separate slide that we've just got, um, so, so you've gone up 100 and, uh, 130,000 uh, tickets or, or people, but that all happened in August, September last year when you jumped up 136,000 in those two months, and the rest of the year's actually been uh, just sort of holding its own. So what what do you think is going to happen? You know, yeah, how are we going to have another August and September like that? Free. Make the buses free. That's what worked. Did that create... Uh, well, that comes at a cost. Yeah, yeah so um, there, was, there was a long period last year when... Um, transport was free and then also so it was being used at a certain level but there were restrictions in piece of COVID then the COVID restrictions were lifted but the 
transport remained free until uh, the B card was um, introduced at some point in September. I can't remember the precise date. Yeah. So um, that was when it was, you know, at that period of time we'd expect there to be particularly high levels of transport use. Yeah, so we haven't retained those people though, have we? If you know what I mean, you, you've dropped that 130,000 extras that we had in that period, August, September, we haven't been able to manage to hold them on um, on the bus, really. Um, I guess you, you could be right. Um, I think yeah. when you're offering something free, um, it would be great to have as many people as possible use it. And yet yeah, we haven't, we wouldn't retain absolutely everybody. But um, again, in the context of the way the rest of the country is performing, Right, um, no, that's good. I'm not. Yeah, th I'm there just, is some. Yeah. I think the uh, once COVID goes, because we still have restrictions on buses, it's difficult to enforce them. But in terms of mask wearing and things like that, and uh, it is uh, there's still some public sentiment. Some people don't want to use public transport until COVID's eradicated. So maybe in you know three or four months' time, the picture may be slightly different. Yeah. Hey, I've got Brian and Kate. Yeah, um, my question is in relation to the $2 fare process, but I'm just trying to think about the 6%. So, yeah, I suspect the 6% is good, isn't it? Because it's in relation to any sensitivity over COVID. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that. So maybe two questions. And the next one is, um, is like the impact of scooters and other transport options. Do you think, that's my first question, do you think there's any... Um, loss of patronage due to other transport op options and dynamics like scooters or central Dunedin and, or is that minor? Um, the short answer is I don't know. Yeah. The per, I guess personal point of view, so we don't have any stats to support it, is yeah. possibly if you look at the uh, student population and others travelling in central London, uh, sorry, central Dunedin <laughs> doing a shorter trips. Yeah. Look, I've used a scooter myself as well. Um, Would you have taken a bus? Uh, I may have done. Well, there you go. Yeah. But um, the, it's... Did you uh, wear a helmet? As part of... Sorry? <laughs> uh, yeah, I did, I did on one of the trips, yeah. Um, the, as part of a multimodal transport shift, we'd like to think it's complementary to and sort of welcome it in wherever we can. Uh, we've had meetings with both the major providers in Dunedin, Lyme and Neuron, and uh, we there's potential to do some work with them in the future, particularly around the central um, tertiary precinct. We've had some discussions with DCC and uh, one of the those two companies uh, about uh, better connectivity between uh, e-scooters and um, and the bus network and facilities for dropping them off without blocking the pavement and that sort of thing. So we recognise in that particular area, for as an example, uh, e-scooters are very popular. Oh, so and the second question is quite simply, that we're currently with $2 fares in Dunedin. What is the process for coming to the end of a trial? Um, maybe this is a question for Gary. Um, so what is the process and what are the financial implications in terms of that process? And we're in the LTP. Through you, Mr Chairman. So, um, as you know, we've been consulting on the draft public transport plan and fares are a big part of that. And yes. So um, the hearings panel has heard the submitters last week and we'll be deliberating on those submissions next week and bringing back some recommendations to Council. In relation um, to $2 fare? In relation to fares and fare For the future? Yes. Okay. Um, and so that will have to consider the fine, or, or Council will have to consider the financial implications of that um, going forward. So, I mean, somebody picked up on it before. The reason we're ahead in patronage is primarily it was free July and August. Um, whereas for a lot of country it wasn't. And that was because, you may recall, we made a decision early okay. on to pull the old hardware out of the buses with respect to ticketing to move to the new stuff. And so that's really worked to our, our advantage. And and so, like, you know, beginning to the end of the financial year, how do we manage that whole financial implications process? That takes a bit of time if we're to carry the $2 fare on. So, so we've given you information over the last few months. It is costing a, a fortune for $2 fares. Yeah. It is, it is expensive, a lot more expensive than we thought. I mean, there are some opportunities... Um, you know, we've had submissions from the local council here about, well, why don't you try one one dollar fees? Well, they'll need five cost millions of dollars to make that happen. How much does it cost for two dollar fees? A million dollars. Um, I think it's running something like that. If, if yeah, it's slightly more. 
in terms okay. of an annual cost. So that's what it is. Yeah. Thank you. Carbon cost, I wonder. So it's not in the LTP. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting place to, because my head is so what with this. It's really interesting information, but I'm not quite sure that it's driving us to um, w how we're going to use it to drive um, better uh, numbers. And one of the things is, if I look on page, oh, table 15, I can't, it's near the end, um, and those mean average, whatever they are, start times where they're meant to be leaving and there's you know an average of 6.54 minutes late leaving or am i missing that out from green island for example it, take the worst case scenario mm -hmm. it doesn't matter the reason is that going to drive people to think it's a good service um i do have to give an explanation for the reason uh -huh. um the green island service is unique amongst the rest of the services and it's a connector service it's the own it's a service that cannot get directly into town um, and relies on passengers who are coming from the city get on a different bus service, the, the Mosgill bus, that then sits and unloads everyone who wants to carry on to Brighton and they change bus and naturally it takes longer to get, say, 20 or 30 people off a bus, tag on if, the, if that bus is running a couple of minutes late anyway because of congestion or whatever. That service is exceptionally busy. Um, often there's two buses at a time because the Mosgill service is going sort of through the roof in terms of patronage. So the, the bus has to hold for that other bus to uh, to turn up. It's not ideal, but it is uh, kind of an exception to the usual. Uh, so so that my yeah. question well, is, uh, so, time. so yeah, yeah, exactly. Why, where, uh, where are we showing that we're mm. being flexible, changing it because it's not working, and to give people that certainty? Because as we know, certainty and understanding the timeframes is really important to keep people doing it. That yeah. I would I would be late for a job. I've changed my driving practices. I come in half an hour earlier now because I want to have <clears throat> an hour's drive. Yeah. If I come in half an hour later, it's in actually an hour and a quarter drive yeah. at least. Mm -hmm. So we're all changing our behaviours. Where do we show that flexibility that the bus services are having to change because of the changed traffic mode? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I'm not making excuses, but the systems have been in place for about a month and a half. Okay. And we're currently, the contractor is building a report that delves into, I'm trying to get too techy, but the standard deviations around peak time. Okay. This table uh, about real time data isn't, like you say, it's an average across a month. So although there are, you know, it sort of looks good and it's reasonable uh, within those averages there are some severe deviations yeah. and we can use that data to inform our timetables and that's very much the intention of having RTI. There was a, a query that Councillor Calvert made in a previous meeting about uh, a different route uh, which was running late at peak times and the data supports what you were saying and that's one of the first ones we started looking at. Right. But we have to you know, build something from scratch to monitor and work out. It's, it's fairly complex and there are lots of moving parts in it but it is very much something we are um, we are using to inform and make the timetable better. One of the ways that the timetables may change is at the moment, they are pretty much, uh, the way the timetables uh, were designed by, back in uh, four or five years ago, was uh, around having a, uh, a common time at, at all times of the day. So the, the bus always runs a half hour route, mm. uh, no matter, you know, on a particular route and uh, with a little bit of extra fat in the timetable for um, peak times, it may be that that, uh, well, I would suspect it's likely that would need to change, so that we run peak and um, off-peak uh, timetables. <laughs> we already do that and have tried that, and it's now operational in Queenstown. It's with a smaller network and four or five routes, it's a bit easier to, to experiment over there. So a number of the routes in Queenstown operate at uh, different journey times and different you know, uh, bus stop timing points. Uh, at peak times to reflect the heavy congestion there. And it's something we would use the new data that we're collecting that we didn't have before to uh, inform the Dunedin network. So I 100% agree with you. Brilliant. You. And uh, last question. And it's, it's one audience that I am really, really worried about that we're not capturing because we had taken them and excluded them out of our survey. And that's under 15 year olds who can't drive and have very little other mode shift. Why are they, and it's probably because of Waka Katoe and nothing to do with us, why are we not asking 15-year-olds to do a survey? So there you're... are privacy issues. You, you can't talk to minors. And okay. that's why the face-to-face -face stuff is about, you know, they don't talk to minors in terms of their satisfaction survey. Um, I, I really want to get yeah, this up, but Hillary's got something burning, and let's yeah. it up. Because this Just quick last question. Has anyone got... 
some ideas about where we're going to get money if we wanted to keep doing this, what we're doing. Because, yeah. I mean, if you come to us next month and then say, Good do you happen to have $800,000 in your purse that you didn't have when we did the long-term plan deliberations, what are we supposed <laughs> to do with that? I'll defer to Gary. So the budget's <laughs> built on assuming, uh, on an assumption that you have the same fair revenue next year as you had pre-COVID, and so that, that's the context of decisions you'll have to make around fears. That will come up at its time. It's not for this meeting. This meeting is really... No, I'm just yeah, thinking that this is that. this sounds like the, that we're being told that we're about to be asked if we want to continue with what we're doing at the moment, yeah. that it has maybe a three-quarters of a million dollar cost to it. And I'm saying... This is nothing new. You knew about that presumably a so, month ago, or no? That's Sorry. not what we're saying. Yeah. This is data Sorry. information, exactly. what, and there was a question mm -hmm. around RPT and where that's at, and yeah. deliberations to work uh, through the process Monday. and how you pay for yeah. all sorts of things. Okay, so cool. That's for next week. Yeah. Okay. I move that we receive this report. Thank you. Seconded. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. And yep. all in favour? Aye. 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 And thank you very, very much. And that was on time, that's interesting. Stuff. Stuff. <laughs> that's really great that we can know now, isn't it? We have received the notice from the Nursing Board today. Thank you.